Good morning po sa ating lahat. Bali, hihintayin lang po natin yung mga iba pang participants na mag-sign in hanggang 8.20 po. Then, mag start na po tayo sa ating program. Thank you po.
morning po, mag-start na po tayo. Yeah. So, good morning everyone and thank you for joining us for the first part of our workshop entitled Livestock Biotechnology Center Virtual Seminar Workshop on GM Animals for Philippine Biotech Regulators. My name is Mitch Ann Gabriel Arbando and I am your host for today's session. We appreciate you taking time of your busy schedules to join us today. We hope you will find the program we have lined up for you to be fruitful and engaging. We are indeed honored to have you here with us and we have about 28 participants from Department of Agriculture's Regional Field Offices, the A Bureau of Animal Industry, the A Philippine Carabao Center, the A Bureau of Fisheries and Aquatic Resources, Department of Environmental and Natural Resources, Environmental Management Bureau, Department of Science and Technology, Department of Health, Health, Food and Drug Administration, International Service for the Acquisition and of Agribiotech Application, DA Biotechnology Program Office. Um, um, Siyempre po yung ating mga participants, sina Dr. Ernelea Kao, Ma'am Lorely Agbagala, Dr. Evelyn May Mendoza, Dr. Jerwin Urdan, and other participants po natin today. Maganda umaga po sa ating lahat. And our workshop is initiated by the Livestock Biotechnology Center together with the Philippine Carabao Center and the ABPO in partnership with the NRCP Division 13. This online activity aims to enhance the participants' understanding on the application of modern biotechnology tools, overview of state-of-the-art technologies, regulatory landscape among trading partners of the Philippines, and relevant domestic laws and policies on GM animals. Before we begin, I'd like to share a few reminders. First, please be informed that this workshop is being recorded and while speakers are in session, you may send your comments and questions to the chat box down below. Please remember to indicate to whom you're addressing the question to. Also, in asking, you may introduce yourself at the end of the session. And now to formally open our program, let us hear from, our, um, from the Deputy Executive Director of Research and Production um, here at the Philippine Carabao Center and the Chief of Livestock Biotechnology Center, Dr. Claro N. Mingala, for our opening remarks. Morning, Doc. Good morning to everyone. Thank you very much. Uh, good day to everyone. Greetings to our renowned uh, resource speakers from the University of the Philippines, Los Baños, uh, Central Luzon State University, the Department of Science and Technology, National Research Council of the Philippines, National Committee on Biosafety of the Philippines, the Biotechnology Coalition of the Philippines, International Service and Acquisition of Agribiotech Application, and also from the Department of Agriculture, uh, Philippine Carabao Center. Our participants from the public sector, employees, staff, and officers in the fields of biotech R&D, regulations, management, policy, and communication, welcome to the Livestock Biotechnology Center virtual seminar workshop on the GM animals or genetically modified animals for the Philippine biotech regulators. Thank you for making time for this activity regardless of your busy schedules and amid the pandemic. I am pleased that we are given a chance to initiate the said activity. According to the USDA report published on February 4, 2020, the Philippines continues to be a regional biotechnology leader. Golden rice or the GR2E field tests were harvested in October 2019 and the application to propagate is expected soon. The regulatory agencies of the United States, Australia and New Zealand, as well as Canada, have already issued safety and nutrition approvals of the GR2E. Parallel to this area, Positive regulatory developments that may come to fruition by early 2020, including the completion of an ongoing review of the current biotechnology regulations embodied in the completion of a uh, 
Joint Department Circular of 2016. Likewise, expected to be in place around the same time are regulatory frameworks for genetically engineered animals and another for new innovative biotechnologies. And with the commercial approval of the first GM salmon in the United States and Canada, it is imperative that regulatory mechanisms should be in place for the eventual influx of GM animal products. Experts believe that there is only a short period of time that GM animal and animal products will arrive in the Philippine shores. In this connection, the Livestock Biotechnology Center, together with the DABPO, DOST NRCP, Vision 13, and PCC has been organizing this seminar workshop to further strengthen the te technical capability and leadership skills of public sector employees. Staff and officers, of course, in the fields of biotech R&D, regulations, management, policy, and communication. Upon the completion of this workshop, it, is, it will provide the awareness, knowledge, and understanding of the scientific and technical principles of biotechnology. It will also help them appreciate the recent state-of-the-art GM animal development in foreign countries, especially among trade partners of the Philippines and relevant domestic laws and policies on GM animals. Bob Solman said, always remember that biotechnology is not just about farming. It's about our future. It doesn't affect just farmers, it affects everyone. So we need to study and work hard as one towards a food secure community. Thank you for joining us today and have a good day, everyone. Thank you so much for your inspiring message. Dr. Claro and Mindala. And before po tayo mag-proceed sa ating first speaker today, may I request everyone po na magsalit po muna tayo ng ating Twitter. And isisend na po namin yung link sa ating chat box. So ano na lang po, pacheck na lang po. Nung uh, 15 minutes po mag-resume po tayo. Thank you po. Si pa, may 
Sa pagkakalabaw ay patuloy na iangat Kabuhayan ng magsasaka ay kasamang uunlad Di ba't ito ang ating pangarap mithihin noon pa man Ang pagyamanin, biyaya, alay ng kalabaw Ano pa nga ba, di ba't sa ating kamay pa rin nakasalalay ang pag-unlad at tagumpay? Kaya't sikapin, kaya't hanapin dagdag, talinot ka lamang sa pagyabog. Kung produksyon ng karnet gatas ay patuloy na iangat Kalusugan ng mamamayan ay bubuti pang wagas Di ba't ito ang ating pangarap mithiin noon pa man Ang pagyamanin biyaya Alay ng kalabaw Tayo na magsipa Magnegosyo't magtagumpay Ikaw ako Ay patuloy na iangat Kabuhayan ng magsasaka Ay kasamang uunlad Di ba't ito ang ating pangarap Mithiin noon pa man Pagyamanin, biyaya, alay na Ay patuloy na iangat Kalusugan ng mamamayan Ay bubuti pang wagas Di ba't ito ang ating pangarap Mitiin noon pa man
44 million people have been forced to the brink of poverty because of soaring food prices. Once again, rising food prices are causing social unrest and political instability in several countries. Food supplies. We have been tracking this story for a few days now and it is getting quite some attention. Food supplies getting very tight. And on the commodity markets, food prices soaring to levels never before seen. In the next 50 years, global population is expected to double, reaching more than 8.9 billion people. Population growth and improved diets will require at least doubling of the food supply. Given the amount of land currently committed to food production, this cannot yield the amount of food needed by the growing population. Associated with the set increase in population is the incessant occurrence of climate change induced by human activities. In connection to the emerging challenges posed by the rapid growing human population, a need for the implementation and the use of advances in science and technology is inevitable. Being a technology which uses living organisms to make innovative products, biotechnology plays a huge part in improving our everyday lives under the circumstances we're facing nowadays. From the clothes we wear and how we wash them, the food we eat and the sources it comes from, the medicine we take to keep us healthy and even the fuel we use to take us where we need to go. Biotechnology definitely plays an enormous impact in enhancing quality of life and responding to society's grand challenges of undertaking an aging and ever-increasing population, healthcare choice and affordability, climate change and energy shortages. Among the many fields covered by biotechnology, agricultural sector have probably benefited the most from allowing farmers to grow more food on existing farmland while reducing water and fuel consumption, resulting in the enhancement of air, water, soil quality, and overall sustainability to the improvement of the ability of livestock to overcome disease and maintain health through the use of improved animal medicines and other methods of disease treatment. Livestock biotechnology provides a solution to the increasing demands for quality and safe milk, meat and other animal byproducts. Recent breakthroughs in biotechnology are the DNA-based or marker-assisted technologies, which are applied in various areas of livestock production, such as animal breeding, which makes use of a genomic selection process that increases the accuracy of selection of young breeding bulls so they can be used with more confidence at an earlier age in the breeding program. Thus, with an increased selection accuracy and shorter generation interval, genetic improvement will be faster. In addition, screening for the genetic defects through DNA technology ensures production of animals with outstanding fertility, performance and productivity. Maintaining health of animals is also made possible through different DNA-based techniques, which include the development of new diagnostic techniques, vaccines and therapeutic drugs. Advancement in animal health technology also offers a great help in measuring disease potential and expanding genomics of diagnostics through recombinant DNA technology, which can be used in detecting animals that carry genes associated with genetic defects and in identifying disease-resistant genes. An equally important livestock biotechnology is the DNA-based traceability of animal products as this provides the consuming public the information on the product origin and production history in order to ensure food hygiene and safety. We 
Meanwhile, wide arrays of modern reproduction technologies, including in vitro fertilization and embryo production, oocyte and embryo cryopreservation, intracytoplasmic sperm injection, ultrasound guided ovum pickup, super ovulation, and embryo transfer are known to be valuable in livestock production for maximizing the potential of outstanding females for reproduction. On the other hand, salmon cryopreservation and artificial insemination are technologies that capitalize on superior males for genetic improvement in livestock. In recent interesting development in livestock reproduction is the use of sex-sorted sperm to produce offspring with predetermined sex for dairy. Furthermore, the use of rumen biotechnology and nutrigenomics are key tools for improving animal nutrition and productivity. These techniques can be used to optimize the goods in food production from animal origin, such as meat and milk, through enhanced efficiency in rumen fermentation and genes nutrient utilization while consequently minimizing the bads, such as greenhouse gases emission like ammonia, carbon dioxide, hydrogen sulfide and methane from enteric fermentation which are contributors to global warming and climate change. Talking about climate change, the imminent danger of loss in animal biodiversity due to environmental stresses and more, which causes their extinction, can be addressed through livestock biotechnology in a process called cryopreservation, which allows animal genetic resources such as semen, oocytes, embryos, cells, tissues, and DNA to be stored in a cryobank for many years under low temperature without affecting viability and future utilization. These are just some of the many significant processes in livestock biotechnology. Innovation and improvement will always be conclusion to a never-ending problem faced by our society nowadays. And as a leading livestock biotechnology institution, the Philippine Carabao Center of the Department of Agriculture is expanding its role in the implementation of the livestock biotechnology program, emphasizing the relevance of livestock biotechnology to the present time. Compounded with a group of well-trained human resource, supporting industries and partner institutions, quality research facilities, well-organized policies, and rigorous information campaign, livestock biotechnology in the Philippines will now be aggressively advancing in creating a healthier, greener, more productive, and sustainable livestock industry, contributing to the national economy and the global competitiveness of the agricultural sector. Okay po. So I think everybody is done na po sa ating pretest and I think everyone is ready na to listen and learn from our invited resource speakers. And with that, Paul, let us proceed in our, uh, to our first speaker this morning. Our first speaker is a graduate of Bachelor of Science in Biology, University of the Philippines, Diliman. She is also a Master of Science in Biology at UP Diliman and a Doctor of Philosophy in Biology at UP Diliman as well. Dr. Kao is a prolific researcher who has co-authored and authored numerous national and international scientific publications in her field of expertise. Dr. Kao's dedication in her field has earned her several scientific awards. She recently received an award entitled UP Diliman Centennial Professional Chair Award last October 19, 2020. She is also a proactive head and member of some organizations or committee that has an important role in our community. She is currently working as a Professor 12 in the Institute of Biology, College of Science, University of, University of the Philippines, Diliman, Quezon City. 
Ladies and gentlemen, to present the introduction of biotechnology, please join me in welcoming Dr. Ernie Lea P. Tao. Morning po, Doc. Thank you, Michi, for the kind introduction. Good morning to everyone, um, to the organizers and the other speakers and the participants, of course, of this uh, webinar training. I have prepared a pre-recorded talk to make sure that there will be no uh, internet uh, connection uh, issues. And so please uh, listen in, uh, view the uh, pre-recorded lecture, and I am here to answer or clarify anything uh, at the end of the morning session. Thank you. Hello to everyone. So the topic that I shall be discussing with you is the introduction to biotechnology. So this will be essentially an overview of the field of biotechnology. I'm sure that some of the details here will be specifically discussed in the later lectures. And I shall be particularly focusing on animal biotechnology. So, Biotechnology is essentially defined as the use of biological materials to produce products useful to man. So this may involve the whole organism or a part or parts of the organism or the product or products that can be obtained from the organism. So examples would be, of course, organisms, uh, let's say plants that are used for food. So we can eat, for instance, the entire plant itself or certain parts of the plant like the fruit or the seeds or uh, the leaves, for instance. And there could also be products that could be obtained from the organism, such as, let's say, for instance, the oil that can be extracted from a particular plant. Now, there are actually two kinds of biotechnology, what we call as traditional biotechnology and modern biotechnology. Traditional biotechnology has actually been used for a long time, and this is the technology that has been utilized to make our vinegar, our soy sauce, our patis, our fish sauce, beer, wine, bread, cheese, yogurt, and nata de coco are just some of these instances or examples that uses traditional biotechnology. And this would be due to the use of beneficial bacteria and yeast that allows, let's say, for the fermentation process to take place. In agriculture, biotechnology involves the production of new improved varieties of plants and animals through what we call as conventional breeding. For instance, we have used this in the case of improvements in the varieties of rice or in certain types of cattle. Now, modern biotechnology utilizes the tools of molecular biology. And this is based on the use of the genetic information of the cell, particularly what we call as the DNA that make up the genes. And the technologies that we have today would be through the use of what we call as recombinant DNA technology or gene cloning or genetic engineering and another newer technology as to what we call as gene or genome editing or CRISPR technology. So uh, you probably have heard of this acronym GMOs or genetically modified organisms. And simply put, this refers to organisms which will possess a new combination of genetic material or the DNA obtained through the use of modern biotechnology. So there is actually an introduction of a foreign DNA from another source into a host organism, which now makes it a genetically modified organism. Let's go back to some of the basics that uh, we can learn about the DNA that we have referred to as the genetic material. So this is known to be the molecule that determines the traits and characteristics of an organism. It is said to contain the codes, what we call as the codes 
uh, that will specify what we call also as the blueprint of life. So um, classical genetics, so the gene actually now can be explained at the level of the DNA, at the molecular level. And this is a simple diagram, let's say, of what a gene will be made up of then the sequences of the DNA in higher forms of organisms, particularly what we call as eukaryotes, then there are sequences of the DNA which will code for certain proteins. And these are what we call as exons. And in between the exons would be sequences of the DNA which will be non-coding. And this will be referred to as the intron. And the final translation of this sequence into the protein, the actually the non-coding regions will be spliced off and what will remain would be the exons that will eventually represent those that will be transcribed as the mRNA and eventually the amino acid sequences in the protein. Now, uh, this diagram shows us the central dogma of molecular biology. This summarizes the basic information that we have about the DNA that, as I've said, contains then sequences that will represent certain genes. And these genes that will contain these DNA sequences serve as the template for the transcription of what we call as the mRNA or the messenger RNA, which eventually can be translated into amino acid sequences, forming certain proteins that may be, let's say, enzymes that will be involved in certain metabolic reactions or that will code for certain structural proteins that will make up parts of plants, animals, including ourselves. And if we just relate then, let's say, ourselves, a gene with a specific function can be isolated from any organism. And we know this, that an organism such as ourselves would be made up of many, many cells, trillions of cells. And if you open up each cell, there is the nucleus that will contain a certain set of chromosomes or what we call as the chromosome uh, complement set. And the chromosomes would actually exist in pairs. So there will be a pair. And each one will consist actually of long stretches of the DNA molecules that will be packed actually at different levels of organization in the chromosome. And within, as I have mentioned earlier, would be then the genes that will be interspersed along this chromosome. And of course, those genes, again, will be made up of the DNA sequences. This is a view, just using another example, let's say this time a plant, a corn plant. And again, all throughout the plant body would be the cells. And again, if we open up each cell, we'll find then the chromosomes in the nucleus. And then if we now open up the chromosomes, at the different levels of organization of packing, then we will find that at the lowest level, then we will have the DNA that again, as I've said, will serve as the codes forming the blueprint of life that will determine the proteins that will make up the phenotype or the characteristics of a particular organism. So uh, how is this concept uh, of the DNA, the discoveries now that we have made in molecular biology, how are these used in what we refer to as gene cloning? Now, as I've mentioned earlier, so modern biotechnology would involve uh, this technology as a main example nowadays. So as the word connotes cloning will involve then making many copies of a particular gene, exact copies of this gene that can be expressed in cells of a particular organism. Or in this case, um, gene cloning started with uh, bacteria. A bacteria is a unicellular organism. 
And what was done generally in this overview, as you can see, is that there will be a particular gene of interest. So let's say historically one of the first, the first um, experiments that were done was the insertion of the gene for insulin. You know, insulin is a peptide hormone that is responsible for the metabolism of sugars. We produce it in the pancreas, but there are individuals who may have um, certain problems uh, either acquired or there may be individuals who may be prone uh, genetically to the condition called diabetes, whereby the individual either is not able to produce uh, enough insulin or would have problems in the production of insulin. And so they will have to take then uh, insulin. Um, so before the insulin was obtained by raising uh, pigs, no, because we are very similar to pigs, the pigs are sacrificed and then the insulin is extracted from the pancreas. Very tedious process and quite expensive before. So with the discovery of molecular biology tools and techniques also, it's now possible that that sequence of the DNA that encodes for insulin is known already and the DNA can be extracted and obtained. And this DNA or gene of interest can be placed in a vector, which in this case would be the plasmid of a bacterium. Okay, and uh, the gene can be inserted, as I have said, into this vector, forming what we call now as a recombinant DNA. Recombinant DNA, this is from where, of course, the uh, term recombinant DNA technology was obtained because now you have now a new combination whereby you have the original sequence, let's say, of the plasmid with now the inserted uh, DNA sequence for this gene of interest, which is insulin, um, which I've used in my example. And the recombinant plasmid is now put in a host uh, bacterium so now this will become now a recombinant bacterium and via selection uh, processes because not all uh, the target host bacterial cells can take up this recombinant DNA. There are different techniques as to how the um, recombinant DNA is taken up, but I will not um, deal so much on that. No, that's a separate uh, topic. But eventually then the uh, recombinant uh, bacteria uh, can be selected, as I have said, and they can be grown. And then the cells therefore are technically clones because uh, bacteria divide mitotically. Um, this is the process of uh, reproduction essentially by fission. And technically, the cells produced are genetically the same, and that's why we call them as clones. And each one will have, of course, now, or will harbor the gene of interest. So in this case, uh, we now have in the market um, recombinant insulin, insulin now that is extracted from uh, bacterial cells. And uh, other applications aside from, uh, in this case, um, medical application would be, uh, we know now today that there had been genes that had also been inserted that will represent the human growth hormone to treat uh, stunted growth or certain metabolic disorders that results to stunted growth. Then there could also be this uh, gene that could be responsible for uh, protein, the synthesis of a protein that will dissolve blood clots in um, heart attack therapy. And of course, other applications like genes that could be inserted in bacteria for uh, cleaning up toxic waste for a bioremediation. And other genes which we might be more familiar with that would be inserted in plants, the most 
um, commonly known example would be, of course, the GM corn, whereby now there would be a gene that had been inserted to make the corn plant resistant to a certain pests, particularly corn borer. So uh, from this basic idea then of uh, gene cloning, then, um, as I've said, the what we may be more familiar with, let me start then with plant, okay, uh, corn. And uh, what happened in this case, as I mentioned a while ago, is that uh, there are pests that actually would uh, infect, infest um, corn plants. Uh, the corn borer is one particular uh, pest uh, that is a problem in um, corn fields. And the usual uh, procedure to eliminate this pest would be through the use of um, insecticides or pesticides. Um, and uh, we know that um, pesticides persist in the environment, will therefore be um, not environmentally friendly, as well as uh, pesticides have been studied to produce um, health uh, effects, um, deteriorating or uh, health effects among, let's say, farmers or those who would spray uh, the pesticides. And so um, what was done in the case of what is known as the GM corn or the Bt corn is to actually get a gene from a bacterium called Bacillus thuringiensis. And this gene, well, for simplicity's sake, has been referred to as the Bt gene, but actually this gene codes for a protein, what is known as a cry protein, which actually is toxic when eaten by uh, the um, larvae, even at the larval stage of the corn borer. And so uh, what was done was to actually introduce this gene. Um, there are actually two, two methods via what we call as agrobacterium mediated a transformation or through particle acceleration. There's like a, a uh, gene gun that is used to deliver or shoot the gene into um, callus cultures of the uh, corn plant. And then so uh, some of these will be able to pick up uh, the gene and select it again. And so those um, transformants we call then eventually will be grown uh, to maturity. Of course, long this would be long research, uh, that will involve the selection and eventually testing then if the uh, plant is able now to express or produce the cry protein so that then when uh, infested by the corn borer again as i've mentioned even as the larvae would crawl and eat the leaves or uh, the flowers or the fruit the cob then they would die and therefore will be, be prevented from further uh, infesting or doing any damage if uh, uh, these um, pests no, uh, become present in the plant body. So essentially, uh, this was how, for example, um, the Bt corn uh, was produced. And from then on, so there are other genetically uh, modified uh, plants, soybean, cotton, and so on, that had been produced generally uh, through this technology. And uh, of course, the difference of genetic engineering is that uh, this provides actually the desired genotype. So in this case, you now have the gene that will be responsible for uh, pest resistance. Um, in the plant. This is also done in uh, traditional uh, biotechnology by conventional breeding, by uh, selecting um, pest resistant, uh, let's say, strains or varieties. But this will involve more time and therefore also more resources as generations 
of uh, selection will have to be uh, conducted. So um, this provides essentially the short term step, the same output or outcome anyway is obtained, but in this case, uh, via a shorter process. Um, just the basic uh, procedure, let's say, for extracting the DNA, essentially this is already uh, some kind of um, recipe procedure. And then once you now have, uh, let's say, the DNA of interest, then this can be introduced via certain, as I've said, uh, methods, uh, whereby then you can transform an organism of interest. Uh, the other technique that I was referring to earlier is known as genome editing. Essentially, again, this is another um, different lecture, but just to give you an overview, essentially, as the word connotes, the idea is to edit, to make changes within the genome of the organism uh, by producing what we call as a uh, cut, no, uh, in this double strand, you have produce a break. And then uh, sometimes, so what happens is that there could be homologous recombination. You remember the homologous chromosomes that I have mentioned earlier. So that then let's say there is a gene that is present in this chromosome, then this can be inserted into uh, this chromosome. So you can have what we call as gene insertion, or if there is a defect here, then this could be repaired by inserting, let's say, the uh, normal gene, let's say. Or um, in another instance, then there could be what we know as non-homologous end joining. So there could be joining of non-homologous chromosomes. So let's say in this case, however, so, um, there could be some parts that could be lost when uh, this uh, two had been joined together. And um, as a consequence then, because the lost sequence may be for a gene that will code for something, then this will result to what we call as gene inactivation. That gene will not be expressed. And um, it's possible that, let's say, because you do not want uh, that gene to be expressed. So let's say uh, what had been done, let's say, in the case of a um, uh, gene that would be responsible, let's say, for the browning of uh, uh, apples, for example, or, or potatoes, for example. And uh, so uh, this could be in, in the case of uh, deletion as uh, uh, we will call it, or sometimes also there could be insertion, so what we call a small indels. And the simple analogy that I can think of to easily understand uh, genome editing is just like what we do in letter editing. So that let's say, for example, in the case of the word for, if we remove, if let's say there is a deletion of the letter U, then the word now becomes different for F. O-U-R means something different from, from F-O-R. And if we add, if we insert, let's say, a letter T, it becomes now a four, which means something else. Also, in the same way, if we retain, let's say, the original uh, word for, but insert L in between F and O, then the word now becomes flower, and which will mean something else. So in the same way, the idea here is to change, edit no, the uh, sequences so that either you do not want something uh, that will produce a deleterious effect then to be expressed, or you make certain modifications so that you express something that would be desirable uh, for the organism. So um, let me focus in particular no, to what is being done in animal biotechnology. So essentially animals have been used as models uh, because of the close similarity of certain animal models uh, to humans and because of uh, certain studies in animal biotechnology then 
these animals had been used uh, to produce uh, certain medical breakthroughs like the development of the polio vaccine, the um, use of uh, model animals uh, to produce or to develop uh, cataract surgery techniques. And of course, uh, firstly, uh, using animal models for, for dialysis that we now uh, routinely use uh, for many of our uh, patients. No? Uh, in fact, it is said that uh, this animal biotechnology has delivered about or developed about 111 USDA approved veterinary biologics and vaccines. And um, what would be specific animal biotechnology techniques that had been done? So um, just like what I have explained earlier, we again encounter the word cloning, which would be to produce genetically the same individuals. Genetically, there will be no difference. They will be genetically uh, the same as a clone would connote. And... Uh, classic example would be the case of what is known as embryo twinning, whereby you have an embryo which is split into half. And we know this from basic biology, you know, the embryo is already the um, restoration of the diploid stage. Um, but if you split then because the cells will divide at this stage mitotically again, as I have explained earlier, then the half, the two half um, embryos now will be genetically the same. And this will be the first step towards uh, cloning. Um, well, it's relatively easy to do in animals, but will have uh, limited applications. But the idea essentially in nature would be that of uh, identical twins, no? which we find in humans and of course um, animals. The idea having that you have just a single zygote is produced and then the zygote we know divides mitotically to produce the blastocyst and then the um, gastrula, blastula, gastrula, and then but um, they are split so that you produce then identical twins, identical because genetically they come from the same uh, origin, they share genetic information. Um, and uh, that is what we essentially have, as I've said, in identical twins from uh, the two parents, but now in this case, um, they share uh, the same genetic characteristics. In the case of our siblings, because this will be different combinations of the egg and the sperm from our parents, technically there will be different assortments and so that we do not genetically uh, share the same genetic information. It may be one from some from the mother, the father, and so on. But in this case, just like in the case of fraternal twins, two different eggs that are uh, fertilized. So, but in this case, as I've said, then they would be genetically the same because they will come from the same zygote. And uh, you might have read about this. This is the famous example uh, of a uh, cloned animal, the case of what uh, has been called Dolly, the sheep. And essentially, she was created from an adult cell. So, that she was an exact duplicate of the adult no? from where the uh, cell uh, from where she was created came from and uh, essentially these uh, techniques that were involved so you have uh, in this case let's say um, from this cow from this animal okay you collect um, the egg okay uh, so, so this is actually done no, in um, animal laboratories. And then um, you can actually remove the DNA or the nucleus no, from this egg. So that's why it's called enucleation. So uh, using a very, very fine uh, needle, so this can be removed. 
And then you have a somatic donor, a somatic uh, cell donor from where now you get uh, the somatic cells and you get now the somatic cell nucleus from this uh, donor and you inject now that somatic cell into this um, egg and then eventually as you can see in the next step the egg cytoplasm and the somatic cell nucleus uh, touch eventually um, this becomes fused to produce eventually well this so this can be um actually induced by the application of a very low level of electrical charge to cause them to fuse to produce a one celled cloned embryo and then so this is cultured uh, for several days so that uh, just like in animal development you produce now the clone black blastocyst so it's cloned eventually when it um, matures to produce the cloned cow because this cow this organism is genetically the same as this uh, somatic uh, cell donor Kung ano bada, let's say this is uh, the mother so it's not produced by ordinary fertilization because it is not a sex cell or a gamete that was used but a somatic cell which is already a diploid so she is genetically the same or a clone of uh, this donor so that's how it is done and uh, this has been done in many uh, actually uh, different animals no um I, I forgot of course to mention no? just like in what we're doing now in in vitro fertilization so this uh, embryo this blastocyst is transferred no? to a surrogate uh, mother who will carry the the offspring and then uh, produce no the the offspring eventually and then she nor cut lang and then this will become the adult eventually um uh, of course uh, the safety of um, these uh, genetically modified animals would be a concern whether they're taken up as food or for other purposes then of course the environmental safety but as early as 2011 there were already workshops to assess the safety of these organisms and in Argentina they do routinely clone sheep for example and then they also do uh, selection no? of uh, of course the idea here is just like in plant breeding uh, coming up together of important traits in uh, an organism a host organism so let's say the the uh, uh, cow that will produce uh, the best milk or the best meat for instance uh, would be uh, selected and uh, in the case however so that's for cloning in the case of transgenic animals so um, how is the introduction of the new genetic material done so this can be done either by what is known as retrovirus mediated transgenics as the word connotes so this utilizes a virus as a vector now um, a retrovirus is an rna containing virus that can infect now the mouse embryos so that with it would be the dna that would be um introduced the dna of interest no uh, however a limitation of this procedure using a viruses as vectors would be the size of the transgene the transgene or the gene that will be uh, inserted or transferred because it will be limited no um if the gene is quite a large then this procedure will not work now another procedure is what we know or is called as pro-nuclear micro injection so very easy to understand so this time the trans gene dna is uh, introduced uh, very early uh, in the stage of development of the zygote and what is done during that stage is to inject you know, the dna into the nucleus of the egg or the sperm uh, this is how the procedure is done. So uh, you have the pronuclei 
and then you inject the foreign DNA into one of the uh, pronuclei. And then prior then to the fusion, and this is done prior to the fusion of the egg and the sperm. And then so once then there is that fusion, so you transfer now the injected eggs into like what is known as a foster mother. So we use here um, mouse no, as the host animal. And then of course the um, process is still uh, random in nature, it's chance. So, but there will be those that will not have it, but there will be those that will have it. And so this is selected and again bred so that now this uh, line will now contain whatever that a foreign gene of interest uh, will be in this um, germline of the mice. Now, other procedures for introducing uh, new genetic material will be via embryonic uh, stem cell method. So the embryonic stem cells are mixed with the DNA and then um, the DNA uh, and uh, will absorb no, the DNA. And then essentially, yun nga, uh, there will be a new uh, DNA that will be incorporated into it. It could be via sperm-mediated transfer. So there are said to be linker proteins that are used to attach the DNA to uh, the sperm cell. So then this will be carried on no, when fertilization takes place. And then also gene guns, which I've mentioned earlier, whereby literally then the gene is um, shot into the animal cells. Hopefully, some cells will incorporate then the gene that had been literally you know, shot into uh, them. Um, what would be some examples of genetically modified uh, animals? Uh, well, uh, one that has caught the interest of many uh, before is what is known as the enviro pig which is um, a GM uh, pig that has been modified particularly because the salivary glands are able to express actually um, an enzyme uh, called phytase that will digest uh, phosphorus in the feeds and reduce phosphorus pollution in the environment. So, you know, of course, um, pigs are fed with uh, feeds and yun nga, the problem though is that the uh, phosphorus are not uh, easily digested and will also be uh, emitted out, no? Um, through the feces in the environment. And uh, scientists at the University of Guelph actually created a line to address this problem, whereby now the pig is able to digest um, high levels of uh, phosphorus. No? And uh, however, um, this uh, kind of pig has not been commercially available. You know, there are uh, more probably um, safeguards uh, that need to be in place when we speak of um, animal uh, biotech products compared with plants. Um, especially, particularly as we go to also the other uh, the other example, uh, which would be um, the case of. Uh, a fish, no? what is now trademarked as the aqua advantage uh, salmon, uh, which in this case now has been approved for human consumption, but took a long time because again of uh, the um, um, technology developer uh, being able to show uh, that uh, certain safeguards would be in place. Uh, as you will note, probably the uh, most common concern would be the fact that animals are able to move. And so the idea then of being able to escape, let's say, in the environment uh, would be the uh, primary concern. And just to mention some basic uh, background information, this genetically engineered salmon actually has been researched on for 
quite some time already, as early as the mid 1980s, and it was in 1989 when the first GM salmon was successfully produced by the Aqua Bounty Technologies Incorporated Company. And particularly, this uh, involves the introduction to the Atlantic salmon of an RDNA construct that is made up of the growth hormone gene that was obtained from the Pacific Chino uh, salmon. And then also introduced would be a promoter that uh, came from another fish, the ocean pout, that actually would uh, turn on the expression of the gene. And you know, as I was mentioning, it took quite some time before the US FDA approved this GM salmon for human consumption, only in 2015. And this is essentially the procedure that uh, was done. So this was the construct, the uh, gene for the growth hormone, because of course, what they wanted here was to produce a bigger uh, salmon. And then the promoter, as I was referring to, because when we speak of the gene being expressed, uh, well, we actually just explain it uh, quite simplistically, but essentially you need regulatory sequences like the promoter and the terminator regions for the uh, gene to be expressed. And uh, well, once that is uh, done, so there are actually uh, details in the steps no, that uh, I am not explaining, because as I've said, that may be a different uh, workshop. And but the idea is so essentially that the uh, gene was micro injected uh, into the uh, fertilized eggs. And then, of course, again, um, some would have then that gene, and this would be the transgenic founder of um, fishes. Of course, some will not. So this will be non transgenic. There will be selection procedures that uh, would be done and different generations of uh, selection. And that is why the research, as you have seen in the earlier slide, uh, took a long time. And uh, well, what would be the advantages of this kind of salmon? So they actually become bigger because it's essentially a triploid uh, hemizygous. And from your um, basic genetics, um, so triploids would generally be uh, sterile because of the unevenness and the unbalanced number of uh, chromosomes that will result during uh, gamete formation during meiosis. And uh, well, this will be all female then that will have that copy. And so the idea also, why do they want a sterile uh, female? Because that would mean that the energy of the cells in the organism will not be used towards reproduction, but instead will be utilized for growth. That is the idea uh, of producing um, this uh, sterile uh, female uh, fishes. And it is said that they can grow to at least 100 grams within um, this temperature compared with their comparators. And of course, there are limitations for use uh, right now. Uh, they are produced only uh, in certain um, water culture facilities in the US, I think in Indiana and some other, one other uh, culture uh, facility. Of course, what would be the benefits of GM animals? Well, then there could be genes that could be introduced that will produce faster growth rates. Um, so of course, that will be beneficial in terms of selling then no? bigger, uh, larger organisms, or probably then uh, those that will produce leaner you know, growth patterns, uh, less fat, because obviously they will be you know, with, uh, bigger uh, fishes or animals, they will be quicker to ma market. And of course, the healthier meat uh, would be uh, beneficial to consumers, uh, would be more attractive to consumers. And so this would be targeted again, as I've said, um, in the pig, in the salmon, and in chickens, and other you know, uh, animals in the dairy industry, like uh, cows. 
And then, um, so this would be more on the agricultural uh, food production side. On the medical side, then they can be used, this uh, GM animals can be used to produce a monoclonal antibodies to treat certain uh, diseases like cancer or heart or cardiovascular uh, diseases, or also to um, uh, address now yung mga transplant rejection, uh, like yung kidney uh, transplant. You know? And of course, the uh, issue probably in the end would be the issue of safety. There are already guidelines uh, that have been in place in order to evaluate the safety of this recombinant uh, DNA animals. And I think this would also be explained in the other lectures. And so this will be the overview that I will be giving to you today. Thank you very much for your kind attention. And thank you so much po, Dr. Tao, sa um, enlightening presentation po para sa ating participants we, uh, regarding the genetic engineering, animal biotechnology about similarities of animals to humans, cloning wherein splitting embryos in half genetically the same, transgenic animals, and biopig, which is genetically modified sal uh, salivary gland, aqua advantage salmon, Salmon was the first GM animals to approve for human consumption and the benefits of GM animals wherein it is quicker to market, market and healthier meat, chickens, dairy industry, and viral pig, aqua advantage, salmon, and more. Ayan. Thank you so much for the... So, bago po tayo mag-proceed, I would like to... Um, Acknowledge lang po ang mga participants natin from the Department of Agriculture Regional Field Offices and to all um, regional offices po. Thank you po. DA Bureau of Animal Industry. DA Philippine Carabao Center. DA Bureau of Fisheries and Aquatic Resources. Department of Environmental and Natural Resources, Environmental Management Bureau, Department of Science and Technology, Department of Health, Food and Drug Administration, International Service for the Acquisition of Agribiotech Applications, DA Biotechnology Program Office, and other participants po natin today sa workshop na to. Maraming salamat po sa inyong lahat. And ngayon po, proceed na po tayo sa ating second speaker. She is a member aca um, academician of the National Academy of Science and Technology Philippines and, and Professor Emeritus, University of the Philippines, Los Banyas. She obtained her BS Chemistry Cum Laude from the Mapua Institute of Technology and MS and um, PhD Biochemistry from the University of Massachusetts Amherst at, um, at UPLB. She headed the plant biotechnology program of the Institute of Plant Breeding and then the crop biotechnology program of the Crop Science Cluster, Institute of Plant Breeding. She was chair of the committees that led the institute, institution of the BS Agricultural Biotechnology and MS and PhD Molecular Biology and Biotechnology um, Curricular Program, and later chaired their Program Management Committee. Her researches on biochemical and biotechnology aspects of Philippine agricultural and underexploited crops have been published in more than 100 scientific papers in referred journal, uh, journals. She was editor-in-chief of two leading scientific journals in, in the country. First is the Philippine Journal of Crop Science, and then the Philippine Agricultural Scientist. Dr. Texan Mendoza has been overseas editor, bioscience, biotechnology, and biochemistry in 2007 to 2011. 
and member of the uh, of the editorial board science editing since 2014. Dr. Texan Mendoza has been a scientist, teacher, and mentor to many students and researchers, and has been promoted the um, culture of science in the country for many years. Ladies and gentlemen, to present the scope of agricultural biotechnology, please join me in welcoming Dr. Evelyn May P. Mendoza. Morning, po, Doc. Doc. Good morning, po, Doc Evelyn. Yeah. Can, can you see me now and can you hear me? Yes, po. Okay, and can you see the screen? Not yet, po, Doc. Not yet. Uh, yes. Let's share screen. Uh, okay. How about this? Can yes, you see? Doc. Yes, po. Okay. Thank That's you. it. Thank you very much, uh, Michi, for the introduction. Uh, good morning to everyone. Uh, thank you um, to the organizers for inviting me. Uh, hey, hello, Bong. Good morning to the uh, the chair uh, or the chief of the uh, Livestock uh, Biotech Center and also the director of uh, PCC. Uh, good morning, Doc May. <laughs> good morning. Good morning to our scientists and researchers at PCC. Alam nyo, may kukwento lang ako sandali. Very proud ako sa PCC. Pag nagle-lecture ako tungkol sa Ag Biotech, palaging uh, pinapakita ko ang PCC at uh, ang kanilang mga ginagawa. And I have been uh, at PCC several times. So, uh, thank you again for this invitation. Uh, thank you, um, Professor Kao, Ernie, for that uh, very uh, comprehensive uh, introduction. So uh, our participants uh, will see that uh, the two lectures will overlap. And I think it's okay because uh, we learn by, repeat, by hearing repeated uh, uh, lectures and uh, learning material. So let me start my, uh, my lecture or my talk on the scope of bi agricultural biotechnology uh, definitions. Uh, the global market, the modern biotechnology applications in agriculture, the products and processes developed and commercialized since 1980s, and then the new developments and future products. So th this definition, um, according to the UN Convention on Biological Diversity, and so we define bi biotechnology as any biology-based technology, so biology-based, which uses organisms or their parts to make or modify products or improve plants, animals, and microorganisms. According also to the Cartagena Protocol on Biosafety, we have this official definition of modern biotech. So when we say modern biotech, it means the application of in vitro nucleic acid techniques. And this will include the recombinant DNA technology or direct injection of nucleic acid into cells or organelles. And then now, uh, with the advent of uh, genome editing, we're also including the genome editing tools. So uh, when we talk of modern biotech, uh, we always refer to this, uh, the letter A rather than the letter B. No? Okay. And uh, this is the scope of biotechnology. Uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Kao already mentioned and discussed this also. So you can see the classical or traditional versus the modern. When we say classical, so we talk about the biofertilizers, the BNF fermentation, uh, antibiotics, vaccines, immune di diagnostics, and of course, animal reproductive biotechnologies, uh, the tissue culture techniques for plants, as well as the mammalian cells, the protein markers. But when we talk of modern now, we'll be um, discussing recombinant DNA technology products and processes, no? like the recombinant diagnostic uh, kits, uh, the, the RT-PCR now for the COVID-19, the DNA markers, the vaccines, the medicines, genetic engineering of plants, and then genetic engineering of animals. 
and uh, and then uh, genomics and genome editing. So modern biotechnology has been uh, expanding, no, uh, rapidly in the last, uh, let's say, uh, 20, 30 years. In the last thirty years, this is the global biotech market. Why are so interested in biotechnology? Because it produces uh, technologies and. Uh, processes and products that are utilized by uh, our that utilized by people all over the world. Look at the the global biotech market value that U.S. Doll, dollars 270 billion 2013, and it's growing at 12.2 percent growth rate. No, biopharmacy is actually the biggest component at 62.10. Bioservices, 24.7%. Bioagriculture is 7.5%, and bioindustrial is 5.4%. So the, the, for bioservices, diagnostics are included in, in bioservices. And uh, you probably remember and have taken note that when the COVID-19 pandemic started in March, uh, in early last year, um, about March or April, we had only one uh, laboratory that was doing the RT-PCR test. That was at the RITM. And now we have uh, more than 1,500 or so. No? So these are by services. And then fermentation is also by technology. And so look at the market. It's $58.68 billion as of 2018. And what do we have there? The industrial applications, food and beverage. Um, so industrial is this uh, uh, big uh, component here. And uh, food and beverage, nutrition, nutritional products, plastics, and others. And uh, we know that the raw materials that are used in the global fermentation come from agriculture. No? So that's why it's very important whether they're using uh, modern biotechnology or traditional biotechnology. Although we are concerned with agricultural biotechnology, I really would just like to, to, to mention these products uh, for health, no? because uh, uh, they are far reaching. So insulin, interferon, insulin for diabetes, interferon for treating cancer, hepatitis vaccine, more than 400 biotech health products in the markets, and thousands more being developed, including the, the vaccines for COVID-19. The reason why we have a vaccine after only within one year is because of uh, the use of modern biotechnology. Um, so this is the, how we uh, define recombinant DNA technology. It's a method that allows the combination of genes in a test tube to form a hybrid DNA. Now recombination occurs uh, naturally, but when we say recombinant DNA technology, it is in vitro method. No? So if you can combine genes in a test tube, then you can also design the gene for a specific trait. And that's how we use uh, modern biotechnology like recombinant DNA technology. And it's a type, it, it allows the transfer of a specific gene for a desirable trait. Let's transfer a specific gene to an organ organism to express a desirable trait. Now, how do we compare conventional breeding with um, breeding using genetic engineering or gene editing tools? No? So remember that genetic engineering or recombinant DNA technology and gene editing are just tools that are used in breeding. When, so in conventional breeding, you, you, uh, you cross the elite line, which contains uh, uh, most of the, uh, contains most of the traits no? uh, that the breeder would like to have. But then um, the breeder may want to, to transfer the trait from a, a germplasm that has that green desirable trait. No? So the other one, letter A, has a green 
uh, circle. Uh, and when you do conventional breeding, you cross A and B, you mix all of these genes. Uh, and uh, the breeder will have to screen thousands of lines to, to be able to select a line that has most the has, has the elite line components or traits plus the green desirable trait from a you know? so uh, thousands of lines will have to be screened by the breeder but when the breeder uses uh, genetic engineering so here uh, then he will just it's it's a more specific you no know? it's uh, it's a, it's called precise precision uh, breeding uh, if these two panels represent the chromosomes of the uh, the two parents, you will need when when the for conventional breeding you mix all of them together. But when you want uh, when you use uh, a recombinant DNA technology or uh, genome editing, you have the gene of interest one page, one gene one page, and you insert that into the chromosome of the uh, of the line that you want, the elite line, no? So that is, this is how uh, it's an analogy of uh, genetic engineering application in breeding. These are the steps, no? So uh, just for uh, appreciation, um, uh, how we do it in the lab, no? So you need to get the gene, of course, of interest by extracting the DNA and cloning the gene, and then modifying the gene and preparing the gene construct, and then introducing that to the organism. This is the step we call transformation. And the rest is um, plant breeding. As less, rest is breeding, either plant breeding or animal breeding. This is the second step, it's very important. So you isolate the gene, but then you, you don't you, you have to modify the gene. This is a very important step and uh, we call this uh, uh, preparing the gene construct. Look at the gene and its parts, no? So when we say gene, uh, the gene is um, very, uh, what they call it, simply, simply uh, speaking, will contain the promoter, the gene X or the structural gene, and then the terminator. Um, so when we do genetic engineering, we can uh, modify the promoter, we can modify the structural gene, and we can modify the terminator. What is the importance? The, the promoter is like the promoter of a boxer, no? So the promoter will decide when, where, and how much the boxer, the boxer will get uh, in a fight. The promoter for a gene will do that also. It will decide when, where, what, what part of the organism, and how much will be the expression of the gene. And then the gene itself can be made, can be modified, or in some cases, the original structural gene is removed, and what you want is added there. And then the terminator, it means uh, just like Arnold Schwarzenegger, no, terminate the terminate the expression, so end it. So the result is a hybrid or a recombinant DNA or what we call the gene expert, gene construct. And then we insert this now in an appropriate plasmid or vector. And uh, this is very basic to all genetic engineering processes, whether microorganism, plants and animals, no? Because everything starts with genetic engineering of microorganisms. So you isolate so here is an insulin gene coming from the human DNA. And if it is uh, this one, we put that in a plasmid. No? So plasmids, they're the circular DNA in E. coli. And this is now a G, uh, your uh, recombinant plasmid. No? And this is now inserted or uh, into or introduced into the E. coli cells. Uh, using transfection or transformation. And the E. coli or the bacteria will now uh, produce more of the recombinant plasmids. No? So, and then um, 
what they they did for insulin is that uh, the insulin when it is expressed so when we say the expression of gene it means that the gene will now be uh, what uh, we call it uh, the gene is now translated into proteins no so from translation uh, transcription to translation to proteins so the the product here is insulin which is secreted so this is the first recombinant product in the whole wide world released in the 1980s it's insulin coming from uh, bacteria we know that insulin usually is produced uh, or was obtained before from the pancreas of slaughtered animals but now uh, and and uh, but now it is human insulin coming from bacterial cells by recombinant DNA technology. So for genetic engineering of plants, which uh, Professor Kao also showed uh, to you, uh, I would just like to go through the steps. No? So sabi nga natin, mag tayo, mas, ma mas uh, naiintindihan natin. So these are the steps in uh, genetic engineering. You have to extract the DNA and then clone the gene. So meaning, isolate the gene and produce multiple copies, many, many copies of the gene. And then you modify the gene and prepare the gene construct. No? Importante. Kasi sasabihin niya kung saan, kung saan pupunta ang gene mo at kung saan siya, kailan siya mag express no? And the delivery is by agrobacterium. No? So we know the nodules of agrobacterium, so kinopia ng scientist, at ginamit sa pagata transfer ng gene but also by a physical method we call particle bombardment so this is the particle bombardment instrument that we have in our lab and the, the gene construct is uh, put on uh, tanks and bullets uh, cover the bullets are covered with the gene construct the dna and then forcibly uh, bombarded into the somatic the uh, the tissues that you want to transform. In our case, uh, we use somatic embryos. No? So, and then, so that's actually shooting. That's why it's a particle bombardment. And this is uh, usually called a gene gun. So then the next step, so mag infectia. So um, the next step here is uh, trying to find which of the cells will have the gene that was bombarded into it. No? So, at first, uh, after bombardment, the tissues will will be dying. No, will almost be dead because of the force. And then afterwards, they're allowed to grow, and so they will grow and be revived. And then selection to find out which of the tissues that are growing really have the cells that contain now the gene of interest. So ito po yung selection using uh, selectable markers like um, antibiotics. So ibig sabihin, pag nilagyan ng antibiotic, lahat ng walang genes na tinransfer, inintroduce, mamamatay. Only those that are transformed will now have the gene of interest plus the selection marker that will allow the cells to grow into plantlets like this. So this is putative. Uh, transgenic plant and then at the greenhouse they're further tested at the gene level to find out whether they now contain the gene of interest no so ito yung proseso uh, na ginagamit para sa genetic engineering uh, pagdating dito this is now the breeder's work you know the plant breeder or the animal breeder with the help of um, molecular biologists or biotechnologists uh, to in, in detecting uh, the presence of the gene in the plants. So, so genome editing uh, was also already explained, but um, this is a, uh, it's a uh, 2010s recombinant DNA technology, 1970s. Okay, and we got the products out 1980s. So genome editing tools 2010s, and the products are coming out already. Why is it so, uh, um, what do you call this, uh, very important uh, tool 
it enables the editing parts of the genome by removing and adding or altering specific sections of the DNA sequence. The simplest, modest, versatile, and precise method of genetic manipulation. So, kung yun ang gusto mong ikat, pwede mong ikat yun. Specific. Kung gusto mong doon ilagay yung gene, doon mo ilalagay specific site, specific chromosome. Unlike the recombinant DNA technology, you really don't know where the gene will be inserted and in what chromosome it will be inserted in. Okay, so that is the simplest explanation and difference that I can provide you. Now, when do we use genetic engineering? When the trait to be introduced is not present in the germplasm of the crop or strains of animals, the trait is very difficult to improve by conventional breeding methods, and it will take a very long time to introduce and improve such trait by conventional methods. Thus, it is an expensive method to use in plant breeding or animal breeding. Its advantages and disadvantages analysis will include cost of development and regulation. What are the applications? Uh, production of important substances such as industrials and health products by microorganisms, plants and animals. The improvement of traits of plants and animals. The design and production of designer foods. Using basic research, very important. If you want to know the function of a gene, use this, knock it out or insert it. No? So my PhD students have used this as a tool in basic research. It's a basic tool in genomics, understanding the, uh, the, the, the whole genome uh, of, our, of organisms and that, the traits that are expressed application or strategies, expression of new trait. BT corn expressing um, corn border resistance that is coming from Bacillus thuringiensis, no? it's a toxin. Over expression of a trait. The trait is there, but it's not well expressed. So you can over express it or you can repress the expression of a trait. So this is what we call antisense. No? So PRSB resistant papaya, long shelf life papaya. Protein engineering, no? so to you modify the enzyme so that it's going to be uh, more, more active, it's uh, more heat stable, uh, it will provide more product, etc. And provide proof of concept, no? so basic. We also have DNA-based technologies. So I... I uh, we have use of DNA markers like DNA fingerprinting for identification of human individuals, plant varieties, and animal strains. No? Of course, microorganisms also. DNA barcodes for species identification and differentiation from other species. So iba po yung fingerprinting sa DNA barcoding. And then the use of marker-assisted breeding in plants of plants and animals. Use of markers for selection and breeding of plants and animals. Simply, no, genetic engineering of animals, uh, ilang beses itong sinabi ni Professor Kao. So just very briefly, you still have that gene construct with a gene of interest, and you insert that into the, M to the nucleus of the fertilized uh, uh, egg and inject, so that's injected with the gene. And this is now... Um, allowed to grow into an embryo and uh, put in surrogate mothers. But of course, the process uh, takes longer than that. You have to check uh, uh, if the presence of the gene uh, in the, the embryos. And, uh, uh, and even if the, the animal of interest, uh, for example, it's a sheep, they would start it with uh, model animals like mouse. No? So now we go, so we have done this, we go to the products and processes. No? So you're interested in the products and processes. And what are those that will go to the, uh, the regulators for their uh, study? No? So actually, it, these uh, lectures are provided so that uh, you will have uh, uh, a good background on how you will be able to 
to do the regulation. So for crop biotechnology, uh, three major products uh, the, uh, or process, uh, what do you call this? Uh, the uses in varietal improvement, DNA markers, and the plant test diagnostic methods. So this is the adoption of GM crops in the whole wide world. Phen phenomenal. No, so you can see uh, from 1996 when the first products were released to this is 2017, uh, more than 100 million hectares for uh, soybean, for uh, corn, for cotton, 24 here, and, and uh, rapeseed or canola. So here you, here beside tolerant, meaning can tolerate the weed, uh, we decide or herbicide uh, um, eight insect protected um, against uh, against uh, Asian uh, corn border or uh, the border for the other uh, or the other pests for for example for cotton no and when we say GM it's usually the combined traits or stock traits of both HT and insect protected um, this uh, shows the adoption of uh, many countries. So there are countries even beyond 16 from ISA 2019. The USA leads Brazil and Argentina and Canada. No, but here we are number 12 Philippines uh, with maize. And uh, take note that um, there are other products aside from the big four. You have the sugar beets, the alfalfa, the potatoes and sugar cane. No, only Brazil has the sugar cane. Um, this shows you the, the, the adoption of the different countries, 95% USA, 94%. And so actually what is said is that the adoption of the GM crops in these countries like USA and, and Brazil is plateauing. No? So reaching its maximum. And even in the Philippines, uh, it's uh, from 0.6 to 0.8, now 0.9 or 0.7 million hectares. Uh, it's sort of, it's, that's more than 50% of uh, the areas planted to yellow corn. This is how uh, they, it looks like, no? So it looks like an ordinary uh, or non-GM uh, uh, corn except that uh, it's really very robust. So I took this picture in Tarlac uh, in, in 2013, is it 2014, during a field trip. Our country is the first country to plant a GM food crop in Asia in 2002. And now more than 600,000 hectares are planted to uh, GM corn. This is how it looks like. You know? So ang ganda niya, wala siyang mga butas-butas, uh, higher yield reduce pesticide use, better grain quality because there are no secondary infection, uh, low aflatoxin infection, etc., or no, none at all. We, we propagate, these are the uh, corn variety, uh, not corn from different companies uh, that are approved for propagation, commercial propagation in the Philippines. These are those for combined trade as of uh, August 2018. So if you're interested, you can go to this um, website for the registry. So farmers in the Philippines can grow this. Pero corn lang. But we import a lot for food, feed, or processing. So these are the... Uh, this is, uh, these are in the list of those approved for direct use as food, feed, or processing as of August 2018. Canola, that is uh, brassica napus or rapeseed, corn, cotton, soybean, sugar beet, wala atang alfalfa. Uh, so if we are eating soybean, ta ta taho, or tofu, be assured that that, that is GM. Okay, so... 
So in the Philippines, we have uh, already the BT egg plant uh, project led by Dr. Hautea. It is the field testing has been completed and uh, they are now awaiting uh, the results of their uh, application for food, feed and processing. And hopefully commercial propagation will come next. So it has uh, the BT gene uh, crossed, uh, the, our eggplant was crossed with the BT eggplant in Mahaiko in India, no? and they brought here and also crossed with our other elite lines. And now we have uh, the BT eggplant in the Philippines, not yet commercially released. We have the golden rice uh, for beta carotene. That's why it's golden. No, in the grain, you know, the rice plant has beta carotene in all its parts, except the grain. That's why it's white. But our scientists uh, put a promoter, uh, use a promoter coming from the grain so that the beta carotene from two other sources will be expressed in the grain itself. And that's why we have the the yellow or the golden rice. Again, uh, in field testing with the field rice and iri, and hopefully we get this uh, product out to the farmers uh, uh, soon enough. And uh, we, we uh, did, uh, we uh, conducted this uh, a project on transgenic papaya with delayed ripening trait. Um, so the solar papaya, if you, are familiar with uh, the green mature, no? so kapag ka meron na siyang sea light or slight yellowing, it will ripen uh, in five days. Three days, uh, full, fully ripe, fully yellow, and another two days, very ripe, and another two days, too ripe to eat. So what we did was to, uh, to do uh, antisense and uh, to minimize, to extend the shelf life. So we got uh, one week, two weeks, and up to four weeks no, to minimize post-harvest losses and provide consumers with papaya fruits of superior quality. Now, what's the status? Um, uh, I'm afraid that uh, we have not done any, uh, after our field testing, um, the project has not been moving. Why? Because we really don't have a breeder, a plant breeder to continue the work. No? So. So if you are familiar, you have seen this beautiful uh, violet roses, ah, violet, blue roses of different shades, actually different shades it can be more blue no, than this. This is, this is transgenic. Started uh, by Santori, by Florigene and uh, developed develop with Santori. So Santori, so first was moon dust carnation by Florigene, uh, then uh, a company in Australia. It was bought by Santori of Japan. And then they developed the, uh, the Blue Rose. Uh, very expensive. This is transgenic. Uh, these are transgenic also. No? So they are available in the market. Um, DNA marker technology for crops, used for marker assisted breeding, etc. And field rice has been using this. So uh, congratulations to field rice because aside, in addition to ERI, which uses this as a SOP, it's field rice that is using it for their uh, uh, breeding, rice breeding. So, bakit siya importante? Kasi it helps in, in cutting down the, the breeding time. Uh, because uh, uh, kapag ka regular breeding, you have to grow out the, the progenies to see the trait. Pero ito, you just use the grain from, from, that, uh, from that generation. Use part of that grain to, to check the DNA, whether it has the marker. No? So you don't have to grow out. It cuts a lot of time. We have used DNA fingerprinting for banana cultivars using SSR markers. So we can distinguish the different uh, saba cultivars of the Philippines. Um, we have their fingerprints done by uh, Dolores Laraño, a master's thesis uh, with funding from DA Biotech. Um, you, we can use um, 
the ribosomal internal transcribed spacer to differentiate the, uh, the aspidiotus uh, species of CSI from the other one. You can use the lump. This is a, a isothermal way of determining diseases. No, the, uh, It was used by uh, Dr. Desura for dengue. It can be adapted for other pests no, in the Philippines. No? So, hindi lang pathogens ng, ng tao, but also animals and plants. So, pwede itong gamitin, pwede i-adapt. And they have adapted it. This is uh, from, uh, I think, Ikrisat in India. Or how about animal biotechnology? For improvement of strain or breed, health products, DNA marker technologies, pet med health products, diagnostic methods and products. So, for improved traits, better environment, and gene farming. So I'm going to also uh, discuss with you some of these. Uh, although, of course, they are, they are not agricultural products, but, uh, but they use animals. This was, uh, mentioned, it was briefly discussed by Professor uh, Kao. Uh, this is the GM pig, Enviro pig. Uh, 2001, not so as early as 2001, they were already, this was already uh, described in a paper in Nature. It has salivary phytase gene. They are, it, the, the pig has phytase, uh, but uh, it's, not, it's not enough to, to break down the, the phosphorus from the phytate no? uh, from feeds. That's why uh, when it excretes a lot of the phosphorus in the urine and feces. But with the Enviropig, that's why it's called environment-friendly, it is a salivary phytase gene. The gene is expressed in the, ah, the phytase is expressed in the saliva only, no? Not in other parts of the animal. It, it hydrolyzes phosphorus from phytate. So phytate, as we know, is present in feeds. Thus, its urine and feces contain 65% less, percent less phosphorus. And they had, uh, there was really a big hype on this uh, in the early 2000s because of its possible, its, its uh, possible impact on environment. Mababawasan talaga ang phosphorus uh, na pollutants in, in the, uh, the rivers, no? Uh, so, however, it took, a, it was taking a long time to get the the clearance first for uh, for food from uh, uh, FDA, you know, so the US FDA. I don't know about the Canada, uh, and uh, and then I think because uh, no, we, this is some um, this is a biotech product that we discuss in one of our courses for MBB, uh, molecular biology and biotechnology. It's two nine two, and. Um, I think the problem this, with this also is uh, the business model. So how are you going to release this? You, can you release this to the ordinary farmer or it will just be really to, uh, to corporate farms? You know? So you can count how many pigs they have and they cannot have more than the pigs that you, uh, that the, the mother company or the will, will sell to these corporate farms. No? So it was, I think, a mod, uh, business model, uh, ethical issues also on uh, GM, GM animals as food. And then the, uh, the approval from FDA was taking a long time. But now what's happening, oh, so they terminated the research and application in 2012. But of course, they, the semen uh, they have uh, the materials to start this again. And China has developed its own EnviroPeak, no? South China Agricultural University and China Agricultural University. And they're going uh, big on this. And uh, one of the scientists that was helping them is actually one of the original scientists in the group in Guelph. No? So uh, they might have some products out um, in the 2020s. If you have seen um, or a zebra that zebra fish that are not black or gray, then that is a GM. 
No? So this is the ornamental fish, transgenic blowfish. They glow. Uh, they have different colors, green, pink, red, and even now, rainbow color. And developed uh, by Jion Gong of National University of Singapore. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, it's a product that is sold in the U.S., in, in, uh, in Taiwan, and uh, here in the Philippines. So if you go to your favorite pet shop, you look out for the uh, GM transgenic bluefish. And uh, these are the uh, products, the health products using animals. No? So animals um, like uh, goats, the first one. The second one uh, using um, rabbits. The third one using uh, chickens. No? Atrin, an anti-clotting drug from GTC Biotherapeutics, so anti-clotting. So if a person uh, blood is always clotting, this is uh, uh, given to the person. The first biotech product produced in the milk of goats. No? So these are the goats that, that are reared in a special um, uh, special building uh, so that, uh, well, the milk, they will be milked for the, the atrine. The other one is called Conestat Alpha. It's a recombinant C1 esterase inhibitor and producing the milk of rabbits for treatment of hereditary angiodema. So swelling of extremities, like, and then a gastrointestinal tracts and upper airways. So 2020 and 2014, Europe and FDA, as well as Japan, South Korea. Kanuma, recombinant lysosomal acid lipase for the treatment of the deficiency, which can lead to uh, build up of lipids in cells and can lead to liver and cardiovascular diseases. So ginagamit ito sa, sa enzyme therapy, no? the enzyme LAL deficiency, the recombinant C1 esterase inhibitor, and um, The company that owns this will be checking the uh, the products for the the marker and can sue the uh, supermarket for selling uh, uh, what they call that selling products uh, that are mislabeled and recombinant veterinary vaccines. No, so meron mga vaccines that are already recombinant. So these are the different the types of vaccines. There are subunit vaccines, uh, porcine, Newcastle disease, etc. No, so you are more familiar with this. They are recombinant vaccines for for use uh, uh, for use on animals, no, for medical treatments of animals. But in biologics, not like the recombinant proteins for uh, for uh, humans, like. Uh, interferon, insulin, hindi pa siya naga, na talagang nadidevelop for, uh, for animals. And new biotechnologies like genome editing, applications in agriculture. We know that white button mushrooms will readily brown. No? So pag na-expose siya sa, sa atmosphere, maya maya yun, brown na siya. So 2016, They use um, gene editing, this reduce the formation of melanin, in also improve the shelf life of the mushroom. Of course, hindi siya nagbabrown eh. How did they do it? The, the mushroom has six polyphenol oxidase genes. No? So it's a cluster of genes, isozymes. Isa lang ang titni knockout. So this is a knockout. So it was deleted or it was mutated. And it reduced the enzymes activity. Okay, na siya. And then the other one is the uh, waxy corn. So, meron na dating product na waxy corn, but this is even better. 
uh, altered starch composition by using CRISPR deletion of one wax gene. And uh, these two products are not regulated by the USDA APHIS. Why? Because the, the, ed the gene editing uh, constructs that were added, you know, that were used, were not in the final product. Pagka wala, yung final, wala sa final product yung ipinasok, in, they are determined as not regulated by the USDA APHIS. And I think you will learn more, more of this uh, from our regulatory uh, safety regulatory speakers uh, in this uh, workshop. And then their FAD 2KO soybean, high oleic acid and low linoleic acid. Soybean oil does with longer shelf life. Paano ginawa nila? E di ni knockout nila yung enzymes for oleic acid and linoleic acid synthesis. Directed deletion, but not, you know, so there are enzymes there for this, but not, not enough to knock out uh, all the oleic acid. Kasi uh, what happened is that um, the linoleic acid, linoleic acid decreased from five uh, decreased. Uh, let me see. Should the oleic acid now is 5.04 versus 53.15 in the original? Oleic acid mas mataas siya versus 20.1 and 17 percent. No? So again, it's not regulated. How about genome editing of animals? Uh, there is only one that I found uh, in the uh, literature. And the internet, this is the hornless bulls, no? So very, uh, ano pa to, uh, in developmental stage. Uh, uh, so recombinetics use talents to alter the gene responsible for the absence of horns, resulting in two hornless bulls. Yung isa, they, uh, it was, uh, it's, it's our two six calves, which are raised on the University of California Davis Research Farm for further study. Now, uh, the recombinetics um, uh, sent this to USFDA for consultation on the suitability for human consumption. But a fragment of the plasmid was sequence was found in the bull's DNA by FDA. So at that point, they stopped the, uh, they withdrew their, uh, their application for consultation. The project was terminated. But recombinetics continues to be developing lab like animals with various desirable traits. So if you know, want to know more, get more information, you can go to the website of recombinetics. And uh, China is doing, uh, doing a lot of work on genome editing for human studies and animal models. Virus-resistant chickens, hardier pigs can withstand whole cold temperatures, fast-growing pigs to produce meat faster. This is resistant pigs, pigs with more muscles, pigs with less fat. So that's how robust is the uh, science and technology in China. The important topics in, in agricultural biotechnology are that I'm not, uh, uh, that I will not be talking about will be biosafety regulation, very important, and social and ethical issues. And these are, should be, these are covered in the other lectures. And this is the timeline of, of biotech from the fermentation products that we are familiar with from 4,000 BC going to 500 to 1890s, 2000, no? So it's 1970s, recombinant DNA technologies. So you can see how fast from 1970, uh, science and technology have advanced up to 20 after the present time, no? So exponential na ito. And we should be ready and uh, capable of uh, not only adapting, but also getting into the development of these products, as well as what? Getting them in the commercial stage, because it's very important that we have our biotech products, our bio industry uh, to be further developed and strengthened. No? So, so with that, I uh, conclude my, my, uh, my talk on the scope of agricultural biotechnology. Thank you for your, um, for listening. Uh, if you notice the, the slides are text heavy, 
and that was intentional because I know I know that you will use this as a resource learning resource material. The PDF is available with the secretariat. So thank you and uh, uh, good morning, everyone. Thank, thank you so Amy. much. Thank you so much, Dr. Mendoza, for your informative presentation and our participants surely understand the genome editing tools, which enables editing parts of the uh, genome wherein we do genetic engineering, applications of recombinant DNA technology, agribiotech products developed using DNA markers, transgenic animals improved jet, uh, traits for um, production and others. Thank you so much, Doc. Welcome. Yes. So since Dr. Mendoza has other important matters to attend, um, Dr. Mendoza is now entertaining questions for uh, coming from the participants for the open forum. And you may now send your questions on the chat box down below po. So yun po. Since may pupuntaan po si Dr. Mendoza, kung may mga tanong po kayo, pwede na po natin i-entertain yung mga questions para sa presentation po ni Dr. And with that po, um, I would like to introduce our moderator for our open forum. Our moderator is a graduate of Bachelor of Science in Biology, major in microbiology at Central Luzon State University and obtained his master's degree in environmental science at the same university. Afterwards, he pursued his PhD in plant molecular biology and genetics agrobiological sciences at the United Graduate School of Agricultural Sciences. Iwate University, Morioka City, Iwate, Japan. He was likewise awarded the Fulbright Advanced Research Scholars, uh, Scholarship Program of the Cornell University, Itaka City, New York, USA. He is a productive researcher who has authored and co-authored of several international scientific research publications. And he is currently working as head of molecular biology and biotechnology laboratory and associate, uh, associate five, Professor Five at the Department of Biological Sciences, College of Science, Central Luzon State University. Let us all welcome Dr. Jerwin R. Uldan, our moderator for today's open forum. Good morning, po, Doc. Uh, good morning, uh, Michi, to uh, all our speakers. Good morning, po, and to all the participants. Uh, since Dr. Mendoza requested to have an open forum, uh, Dr. Mendoza, do you hear me clear? Uh, yes, uh, Jerwin. Do you uh, hear yes, me? Ma, also? Po? <laughs> yeah, fine. Thank you. Um, it's good to meet you. I I uh, I think it's my first time to to meet you, Jerwin. Ah uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, okay. So we have now the uh, open forum for Dr. Mendoza. Uh, here is the question, ma'am. Uh, when people hear GM products, they have doubt consuming it. For you, what is the best way informing people that these products are safe to consume? Okay, thank you, Jerwin. You know, uh, that question is uh, always, uh, ano ba tawag doon? Uh, nauuna talaga. Kahit ang, pinag ang sinabi mo ay tungkol sa principles or sa applications, ang tatanungin ay food safety. Kaya importante talaga yung food safety rin nandun din sa, le, sa, sa talk eh. No? So, ito yung pwede natin sabihin. Lahat ng produkto ng modern biotechnology na ngayon ay nasa market. Sila ay na-approve na for safety, for food, as food, feed, and processing. And they are safe also to the environment. Hindi sila mai itatanim at maipagbibili kung wala silang uh, safety approval from the regulatory system of the country. So ang um, ating country is, was first in this regard, 1990s, nagsimula na tayo. And we have a, I, and I'm very proud of it, a very robust ang aking favorite term, uh, biosafety system, biosafety regulatory uh, uh, system. Uh, medyo masyado nga lang silang mahigpit ano? pero dahil mahigpit sila assure tayo na yung produkto na lumalabas na a sa atin 
ay safe for food, feed, and processing. So I think yun ang pwede nating sabihin na uh, aprobado yan sa for, for food safety. No? So kapag kinain natin, wala tayong, hindi tayo uh, makakasakit, hindi sa, sa environment din, wala din siyang problema. Siguro, Jerwin, yeah, Jerwin, siguro yun na lang. Okay, ma'am. Uh, thank you po. So, ito po yung next question. Uh, how molecular biology can help or aid in fast-tracking breeding activities in terms of animal improvement? Um, sa animal improvement, I, I think uh, right now, the best... Uh, technology would be your DNA markers to aid in the breeding process no so yung parang marker aided selection so yung using the, the markers you can you can now see uh, even uh, maliliit pa yung progenies makikita mo na kung ano yung traits na kung ano yung genes nila doon that if you have already they have the genes of interest no Parang sa, uh, probably more people are from familiar with the use of DNA markers for breeding or uh, of crops. Uh, ginagamit din ito sa breeding ng animals kasi mas mahirap na ang sa animals, mas matagal. Ang gamit ng advanced molecular techniques for, uh, for, uh, for uh, breeding, no? so yung like uh, genetic engineering and gene editing, medyo malayo pa tayo doon talaga kasi like uh, yung envirupig no na uh, 2001 it was already published in nature and that 2009 they were hoping that uh, uh, it could have a release uh, in the US and in Canada uh, but uh, unfortunately um, the una the, the the company that was uh, supporting the project withdrew na no stopped already why kasi they, they, i don't think they could see the commercialization of the product because of the uh, the ethical issues no acceptance ng gm animals um, and then yung business model as i was telling you before and the third one siguro yung sa sa, sa health no yung processing ng FDA palagay ko para ding salmon yan eh. it will be approved uh, it would have been approved in due time pero dahil dun sa first two reasons the uh, the project was terminated pero China is uh, working on it because of the big problem with uh, the pollution of uh, rivers by the swine uh, farm excreta so let's think about it you have to weigh no uh, the pros and cons. Y yung siguro yung dalawa. Una, palagay ko dapat gagamitin na yung DNA markers. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Um, thank you, Jervin. I think, uh, another question last siguro, ma'am, ito, no? From, uh, let's see, from Miss uh, Florence Sevilla of USDA FAS. The question is, do we have a biotech harmonization policies program in the Philippines? Uh, thank you, Jervin. Again, no, the questions really are ahead of the topics. Uh, uh, wait for uh, who is going to talk about it. Is it um, Lord Malu Ag Agabala for biosafety? But uh, para lang uh, to assure uh, Ms. Uh, Florence, Yes, there is biotech harmonization. Hindi lang sa atin sa Pilipinas, but all over the world. This is international. Para yung pag sinabi sa, sa, sa Australia, sa Canada, it's, it's safe for food, feed, and processing. Then when, when the product comes to us, makikita na ang produkto ay up to par. No? Ibig sabihin, we are uh, using the same metrics so if our products in at the same uh, in, in reverse tayo naman ang nagpadala dahil nakalag nakalagpas yon sa sa ating uh, biosafety system regulatory system the ad, other countries will also uh, honor uh, the results of our uh, uh, what do you call that studies pero siyempre pag-aaralan din nila 
So abangan natin ang mga susunod na lecturers. Uh, thank you, Jerwin. Okay. Thank okay, you, ma'am. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mendoza. So I think that's it for Dr. Mendoza. So maraming okay. salamat po. Thank you very much, everybody. Uh, okay. I, I see familiar faces and, um, and names, and uh, I'm very pleased that uh, I could be with you this morning. So again, thank you, Jerwin, Michi, and uh, Justin of the Secretariat. Bye-bye. And Ernie, Ernie Leia was my student uh, uh, when she was an undergrad in chemistry. But bago akong PhD no na kaya wag yung sabihin no. no so I'm very wow. proud of my graduates. Thank you, thank you, my former teacher. <laughs> thank you, Ernie. Thank you, Ernie. <laughs> So, Doc, okay, before okay, po okay, tayo, ay, before po kayo umalis, i-present po muna namin sa inyo yung um, certificate. Yes, thank you. Okay, thank so, you very much. So, to present uh, this certificate of appreciation to Dr. Evelyn May T. Mendoza for her time and expertise as a resource speaker during the Livestock Biotechnology Center virtual seminar workshop on GM animals for Philippine biotech regulators on March 17 to uh, 19, 2021, under signed by Chief of Livestock Biotechnology Center, Philippine Carabao Center, Claro and Mingala, and um, OIC Executive Director, Philippine Carabao Center, Dr. Ronnie D. Domingo. Yun po, ma thank you so much po. Thank you then, thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye po. Thank you very much. So, yung mga ibang questions po na hindi natin na uh, nabanggit sa kay Ma'am uh, kay Doc Mendoza ngayon, no worries po, you can send the questions po later and then we will consolidate na lang din po yung questions niyo. Okay. So, ngayon po, magkakaroon lang tayo ng 5 minutes break po. Tapos proceed na po tayo sa next speaker po natin. Thank you po. Hello, good morning everyone. Uh, uh, habang nagbe-break po tayo for five minutes, okay? Uh, I'm Louie Baliga, LBC staff and uh, co-host of Miss Mitch Bondo. Okay, so again, uh, we want to acknowledge the presence of our participants from the Department of Environment and Natural Resources, Biodiversity Management Bureau, Sir Jerry De Hukos, Mitsibi Pamulaklaki, and Ma'am Joanna Marie Malupa. And we would like to thank our participants from Bureau of Animal Industry, Carlo Paolo L. Quinta, Albert F. Ascalero, Justin R. Sawagdan. Thank you, Pa. And also, we'd like to, to say thank you to our participants from the DA, Regional uh, Field Offices, Cordillera Administrative Region, uh, to Ma'am Leslie C. Deligen, JVP Canol, Carl Glenn L. Higes, Sir Ruben A. Dulagan, and Sir Erickson C. Yopadi. And thank you rin po sa ating uh, Department of Agriculture Turino Experiment Station, Sir Jake T. Casbalido. And also from the Department of Agriculture, Regional Field Offices, Region 2, headed by uh, Doc Roxanne Grace Rubia. Hello, Doc. Uh, uh, me, Doc Jean Brian. Bosito, and also to Doc Christine Maramag. Hello po sa inyo dyan sa Region 2. And from DA Regional Field Office 5 din po, thank you to Sir Fermin C. Rabusa Jr., Josefina Ulep Banyadera, Rosella Asiko Tenefrife. Thank you po. And also, we would like to say thank you to DA RFO Region 12, Sir Neil C. Doton, Ms. Sheena May Kulabar and Sir Hobi uh, Naor C. Moscoso. Thank you rin po sa DARF 8, Renato P. Distrajo, Arlene Grace F. Mercado, Gary R. Deasis, Lyndon Jake C. Canas. Thank you po. 
And also, maraming salamat din po sa ating po mga participants from the Department of Health Biosafety Committee so to Sir John Carlo Malabad and also from the Food and Drug Administration, Sir John Mark G. Tan. Thank you rin po sa DARFO2 Nueva Vizcaya Experiment, uh, Experiment Station, si Sir Joshua po. Thank you po. And also we would like po to acknowledge po uh, the uh, presence uh, from the uh, United States Department of Agriculture, Foreign Agriculture Service, U.S. Embassy Manila, Sir Florence M. Sevilla, and to Sir Ryan G. Bedford. And uh, siyempre po sa ating pong mga participants from the DA Biotechnology Program Office, maraming salamat po sa inyong lahat dyan sa DA BPO. And also from here, uh, Sa PCC, Philippine Carabao Center, thank you so much po from the ISAA and also from the NRCP Division 13. Maraming salamat po sa inyong lahat. Okay, so tapos na po ang ating five minutes break and I think ready na po tayo mag-proceed sa ating third speaker sa araw na ito. Our third speaker, she finished her BS and MS in plant pathology at the University of the Philippines, Los Banos, then awarded the Fulbright Philippine Agriculture Advanced Research Grant in the U.S. Fort Lauderdale Research and Education Center, Florida. Dr. Ad Bagala served as a sur uh, supervising agriculturist area manager at the National Plant Quarantine Services Division post-entry quarantine station and vice chair of the Bureau of Plant Industry Biotechnology Unit for almost two decades from 1990 to 2019. She is currently working as an assistant scientist and head secretariat National Committee on Biosafety of the Philippines Department of Science and Technology to present the topic entitled in, uh, Ensuring the Safety of Biotech uh, Products Please join me in welcoming uh, Maria Laurely Yu Albagala. Morning po, ma. Yes, good morning. Yes, good morning, Michi, and thank you for the introduction. Good morning, everyone. So I will, I'll try to share my screen. Disabled. Can I, can I have uh, the permission to share my screen? You, you disabled. Yes, po, ma. Wait lang po. Uh, we have two very excellent presentations before from Dr. Kao and from Dr. May. Okay. Uh -huh. Share. So, uh, can you see my screen? Yes, ma'am. Okay na po. Okay. okay. Um, so I was I was actually requested to uh, present the topic on ensuring the safety of biotech products and actually I, I'm sure uh, most of you here have already seen this presentation uh, a number of times a lot of times and uh, I've just actually included some topics that uh, you have requested me to include in the presentation so maybe some of the of the uh, topics here have already been discussed by Dr. Kao and by uh, Dr. Uh, Mendoza so next so uh you would ask uh why we need to regulate biotech products well um it is important that the technology is approved as safe for humans animals and the environment and it is also recognized that any new technology can create doubt and mistrust to the public and also to the consumers so to forestall that doubt and to in part uh, ensure consumer acceptance, strong regulation based upon an internationally recognized approval process is necessary to a more efficient commercialization of GM plants, animals, and their products. And uh, if you must know, the Philippines was the first country in the Sion region to develop a biosafety system. 
And it all began in 1987 when scientists from the University of the Philippines in Los Baños, the International Research Institute, and the Department of Agriculture constituted themselves into an ad hoc committee on biosafety. And uh, this ad hoc committee lobbied. So they really lobbied before the national government for the formulation of a national policy on biosafety and the creation of a technical body to draft guidelines that would ensure that experiments where genetic manip manipulation is involved do not pose uh, unacceptable risk to human health and the environment. And so uh, actually these efforts and policy initiatives of the scientific community subsequently led to the creation of the National Committee on Biosafety of the Philippines. In uh, October of 1990, former President Corazon Aquino issued Executive Order 430 constituting the NCBP. And uh, this is a multidisciplinary interagency scientific and technical advisory committee tasked with uh, undertaking the study and evaluation of existing laws, policies, and guidelines on biotechnology and recommending measures for its effective utilization and prevention of possible harmful effects on the environment. And uh, following the issuance of EO430, the Philippine Biosafety Guidelines for Contained Use of GMOs was released in 1991, followed by the Planned Release Guidelines for GMOs and, po and Potentially Harmful Exotic Species in 1998. Then in July of 2001, the Policy on Modern Biotechnology was issued by then President Gloria Macapagal Arroyo, advocating for the promotion of safe and responsible use of modern biotechnology and its products. Then the following year, the Department of Agriculture uh, Administrative Order Number no. 8 was issued, and this governed the rules and regulations for the importation and release into the environment of plants and plant products derived from modern biotechnology. And it also transferred the uh, decision-making process and monitoring of food trials to commercial propagation to the uh, Department of Agriculture Bureau of Plant uh, Industry. Then in uh, 2006, our national biosafety framework was developed through EO514. It is a combination of uh, policy, legal, administrative, and technical instruments developed to attain the objective of the Cartagena Protocol on Biosafety. And it also expanded its membership to include other departments and other sectors of society. And it also delineates the responsibilities of regulatory agencies involved in GMO regulations with regard to risk assessment. And finally, in April of uh, 2016, the Joint Department Circular was approved and signed by the Secretaries of the Department of Science and Technology, Agriculture, Environment and Natural Resources, Health, and uh, Interior and Local Government. And the uh, JDC was drafted in response to the nullification of the DAA 08 by the Supreme Court last December 8th of 2015. And uh, this joint department circular sets out the rules and regulations for the research and development, handling and use, <clears throat> transboundary movement, release into the environment, and management of genetically modified plant and plant products derived from the use of modern, modern uh, biotechnology. And until today, there is no specific laws enacted to regulate the biosafety of GMOs. However, there is a pending bill filed at the House of Representatives, the House Bill Number 3372, and this is an act promoting safe and responsible use of modern biotechnology and establishing the Biotechnology Authority of the Philippines. So, um, NCBP is the uh, is considered as the uh, highest biosafety policy making body. And it is conferred with uh, authority and functions to undertake the following mandates. And that is to set scientific, technical, and procedural standards on by safety, coordinate and harmonize interagency and multi sector efforts to develop by safety policies, act as a clearinghouse for by safety matters, and oversee the implementation of the national by safety framework. So, what you see in your screen is the structure of the NCBP. So it is under the Department of Science and Technology, and it has its, as its members 
the departments of agriculture, environment and natural resources, health, uh, the ILG, DTI, and the Department of Foreign Affairs. And uh, these departments are mandated to implement the national biosafety framework. And uh, NCBP also houses the Biosafety Clearinghouse, which is the depository of all information on genetic, um, genetic modified organism. And uh, under our existing framework, these government agencies have clearly defined roles in the implementation of our biosafety regulations. Uh, we have the DANR, which evaluates the environmental risks and impacts of application for field trial, for commercial propagation, and for uh, direct use. The DOST, which evaluates applications for contained use and confined tests. The Department of Health, uh, which takes, takes care of the evaluation in, of the environmental health, health impact of regulated articles. The DA, which, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, the DA, which evaluates all applications for field trial, commercial propagation, and direct use. And this, they are the, the DABC is the recommendatory body to the BPA director. The DILG, which supervises the public consultation and process for field trial. The FPA, which uh, do the or which is responsible for the determination if application is duly licensed as a pesticide handler, the B, the, the BAE, or the Bureau of Animal Industry takes care of the determination of compliance with feed safety standards, and the Plant Product Services Division of BPI, uh, which is responsible for the determination of compliance with food safety standards. There are actually two major international protocols that address genetically modified organisms, the uh, Cartagena Protocol on Biosafety and the Nagoya Kuala Lumpur Supplementary Protocol on Liability and Redress. Uh, the Cartagena Protocol on Biosafety is the major international instrument on genetically modified organisms. The uh, protocol was adopted on January 29 of 2000, and it became effective in September 11, 2003. And at the moment, the protocol has 173 parties. And the um, primary objective or the, the protocol is designed to protect both the biological diversity and human life from any adverse effects of organisms modified by modern biotechnology. And uh, the Philippines became party to the protocol when the Philippine Senate ratified the Cartagena on October 5, 2006 and it came into force on January 3 of 2007. The Nagoya Kuala Lumpur Supplementary Plot Protocol and Liability and Address, on the other hand, provides uh, international rules and procedures on liability and redress for damage to biodiversity resulting from living modified organisms. Uh, it was adopted in October of 2010, and as of the moment, it has 41 parties and it entered into force March 5 of 2018. And the Philippines is actually not yet a party to the protocol. Um, okay, all LMOs which may have uh, adverse effects on conservation and sustainable use of biological diversity, taking also into account risks to human health are covered by the protocol. And the AIA or the Advanced Informed Agreement Procedure is the central mechanism for regulating the transboundary movement of LMOs. And uh, the AIA procedure applies to LMOs that are destined for release into the environment, for example, crops for planting. The AIA uh, defines the mandatory procedures to be applied to the first transboundary movement of an LMO for intentional introduction into the environment. And so this procedure requires that Prior to the first intentional transboundary movement of a specific LMO, the importing party be notified of the proposed movement, receive information about the LMO and its proposed use, and have the opportunity to decide whether the import should be allowed and on which conditions. So in other words, the AIA procedure mainly involves a four-step process. First is the notification by the exporter, and then second is the acknowledgement of receipt by the uh, importing party, the decision procedure, and the review of decisions by both parties. And actually, this one, one good example of this is 
when uh, an applicant or company uh, applies for importation of a certain GM product. Like uh, they would file an application, like for example, at BPI, at the quarantine, and then the quarantine would be um, uh, conducting a risk assessment for this uh, regulated article applied for importation. And all the information given will be coming from the exporting country. But actually, all these uh, in, uh, GM articles or GM uh, products have already undergone a risk assessment by the technical experts for food safety and environment before they can be applied for um, uh, importation for the refuse. <clears throat> uh, however, the protocol specifies that the AIA procedure does not apply to certain categories of LMOs, namely LMOs that are pharmaceuticals for humans, which are addressed by other agreements or organizations, LMOs in transit, LMOs destined for contained use, and LMOs for food, feed, and for processing. However, uh, countries have the right to regulate the import of these categories of LMOs on the, base, on the basis of their domestic legislation. So, um, okay, although the Cartagena Protocol on Biosafety is the only international instrument that, exclusively, that deals exclusively with GMOs, there are also a number of separate international instruments and standards uh, that address various aspects of biosafety. And this include the International Plant Protection Convention, which protects plant health by assessing and managing the risk of plant pests, the Codex Alimentarius Commission, which addresses food safety and consumer health. Then we have the World Organization for Animal Health, or the OIE, which develops standards and guidelines designed to prevent the introduction of infectious agents and diseases into the importing country, the World Trade Organization agreements, such as the agreement on the application of sanitary and phytosanitary measures and technical barriers to trade agreement, which contain provisions that are relevant to buy safety, and the OECD, or the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, which undertakes harmonization of international regulations, standards, and policies. So in that note, uh, being part of the protocol, we are expected to implement these provisions and that it is through the national biosafety framework. So the, uh, the, the protocol's fundamental concept is known as the precautionary approach, which states that where there are threats of serious or irreversible damage, lack of full scientific certainty shall not be used as a reason for postponing cost-effective measures to prevent environmental degradation. So what does it mean? So it means that even when the absence of scientific cert certainty makes it difficult to predict the likelihood of harm occurring or the level of harm should it occur, it shall not prevent concerned government departments and agencies from making the appropriate decision to avoid or minimize such potential adverse effects. And this actually expresses a need for decision makers to anticipate harm before it occurs and an obligation for action to prevent or minimize such harm. And uh, this implements that when an action carries the risk of harm to human health, even if there is some scientific uncertainty about the cause and effect, precautionary measures should be taken by concerned departments or agencies to prevent or minimize such risk from occurring. So that is the, the, the precautionary approach. And then with the risk assessment, the Philippine Biosafety Regulations and Guidelines requires that the deliberate release of GMOs into the environment or market should be governed by a framework of science-based risk assessment and risk management measures. And the elements of the risk assessment outlined in a regulatory framework requires consideration of potentially harmful effects to human health and the environment. And it requires that decisions be based on risk assessment that are undertaken in a scientific manner based on recognized risk assessment techniques, taking into account scientific guidelines developed by relevant international organizations. Well, um, the Philippines is one of the early developing countries that has commercialized uh, GMOs. And as early as December of 2002, we approved the commercial release of one eight ten event, otherwise known as BT corn. And uh, strict adherence to scientific and evidence-based risk assessment characterize the Philippine risk assessment framework, both for single and multiple traits in the approval of GMOs for contained use, 
for field trials, for commercial release, and for direct use as food, feed, or for processing. And also, the Philippines recognizes that genetic engineering has the potential to help increase production and productivity in agriculture, forestry, and fisheries. However, we're also aware of the concern about the potential risk posed by certain aspects of modern biotechnology. So having said that, the Philippines supports a science-informed evaluation system that would determine the benefits and risks of each individual GMO. We subscribe to a case-by-case -case approach to address the concerns regarding the biosafety of each product or process prior to its release. We uh, evaluate the possible effects on biodiversity, the environment, and food safety, and also the extent to which the benefits of the product or process at way its risk are also being assessed. So our, our evaluation process also takes into consideration the uh, experience gained by national regulatory authorities in giving clearance to such products. And um, we have careful monitoring of the post-release effects of these products and processes, which is also in place to ensure that uh, their continued safety to humans, animals, and the environment. Access to information. So under the biosafety framework, concerned departments and agencies are required to disclose all information and GM applications in a prompt and timely manner, subject to reasonable limitations to uh, protect confidential information. However, uh, concerned agencies may also refuse in declaring the confidentiality of such information if it is necessary to effectively conduct a scientific risk assessment. And uh, also such departments and agencies may require applicants to provide the information directly to concerned stakeholders. Then we have the uh, biosafety clearinghouse. The uh, information sharing mechanism under the protocol is through the Biosafety Clearinghouse administered by the Secretariat of the Convention. It was established to facilitate the exchange of scientific, technical, environmental, and legal information on GMOs and to assist members to implement the protocol. And the uh, examples of information contained in the BCH or the Biosafety Clearinghouse include any existing laws, regulations or guidelines for implementation of the protocol, summaries of risk assessments or environmental reviews of GMOs, and final decisions regarding the importation and release of GMOs. So some of you may not be aware that we have a bio BCH Pilipinas and also the central BCH portal, which contains all information on GMO. So you may visit, we have actually, you can actually go to the website on BCH and the BCH Philippines and the BCH Central Portal. And this is under the uh, Convention on Biolo Biolo Biological Diversity. So public awareness, education, and participation. Um, it is clearly important that individual citizens understand and are involved in national decisions of GMOs. The uh, protocol encourages cooperation on promoting public awareness of the safe transfer, handling, and use of GMOs. And it specifically highlights the need for uh, education and the public to be uh, actively consulted on GMOs and by safety. And it is important that individuals, communities, and non-governmental organizations should remain fully engaged in this issue because this will enable the public to contribute to the final decisions taken by governments thus promoting transparency and informed decision-making. Uh, well, public awareness, education, and participation clearly is one of the fundamental elements of the Philippine Biosafety Regulation. We recognize that it is important for the public to know and understand the issues and processes related to GMOs and to have access to relevant information in order to make informed choices and actions and also to be able to participate effectively in the decision-making process. Public participation. Well, public participation is maybe one of the biggest challenges in biosafety implementation because it means allowing the public to participate in all steps in the approval process from the time when an application is received to making a decision on the application. But on our part, we actually, we have met this requirement by including 
members of the public like the non-governmental organizations, farmers or traders to be members of institutional by safety committees. And uh, further, we have a requirement for public hearing when conducting or applying for field trials by posting the public information sheet in conspicuous places in the area where field trials will be conducted and by publishing in newspapers of, of wide circulation when applying for commercialization and importation for food, feed, or for processing. And we also have an adequate time frames for public participation procedures. And uh, this would allow the public and other stakeholders ample time to understand and analyze the risks and benefits of, and give their comments. And uh, the public must likewise be informed of the final decision promptly, have access to the decision, and shall be provided with the reasons and considerations resulting in the decision. So the country's national by safety framework, the executive order 514 and the joint department circular takes into account uh, the socioeconomic and ethical consideration in its decision-making process. Uh, in terms of uh, socioeconomic considerations, we have several independent socioeconomic scientific studies using different methodologies conducted like ex ante or before commercialization and ex post after commercialization. And the results of these independent studies were used as basis in the formulation of questionnaires for socioeconomic, ethical, and cultural considerations for applications for field trial, commercial propagation, and for direct use for food feed or for processing. And uh, the Philippines uh, sex assessment process we started with a simplistic interpretation of the country's national goals on food security and alleviation of poverty. So in our uh, SEC assessment, the uh, quantifiable indicators that are reflected in the national developmental goals were productivity, cost efficiency, net farm income, trade, and global competitiveness. For uh, countries like the Philippines that trade in GMOs, we need to have the capacity to implement the protocol and we need skills, equipment, regulatory frameworks and procedures to enable us to assess the risk, make informed decisions and manage or avoid any potential adverse effects of GMOs. So the protocol actively promotes international cooperation to help developing countries and uh, countries with economies in transition to build the human resources and institutions needed for by safety. And uh, it also encourages governments to assist others with scientific and technical training to promote the transfer of technology and know-how and to provide financial resources to those countries. For, other, for the other key features of the protocol, our uh, by safety regulatory framework also has established rules and procedures for the safe transfer, hunting and use of GMOs with specific focus on transboundary movements. We have a set of procedures for GMOs for transit and for contained use, for GMOs that are intended to be used directly as food or feed or for processing, and for illegal and intentional transboundary movement, it is being addressed by our quarantine dose and other SPS measures. So, um, okay. So this is Sudan, the last male northern white rhino at the Old Peheta Conservancy in Kenya, Sudan, and in, in Kenya. And uh, Sudan died in March of, of 2018. And actually, this article was originally published in Fortune magazine uh, on, on, on that same year. And the article was saying that we are facing a global crisis in biodiversity loss. And uh, tens of thousands of animal species are becoming extinct every year. And about half of the world's biodiversity has disappeared since the, since the 70s. And so to safeguard our planet's biodiversity, we need uh, innovative new approaches. And unfortunately, the uh, rapid advances in biotechnology hold promise. There are uh, new genetic and biotechnology tools which are already being used in medicine and agriculture systems particularly with crops and domestic animals. And uh, the uh, animal biotechnology in use today is built on a long history. And uh, some of the first biotechnology in use includes traditional breeding techniques that date back to 5000 BCE. And uh, such techniques include crossing diverse strains of animals, 
to uh, produce greater genetic variety. The uh, offspring from these crosses then are bred selectively to produce the greatest number of desirable traits. For example, female horses have been bred with male donkeys to produce mules, and male horses have been bred with female donkeys to produce hinnies for use as work animals. And that is for the past 3,000 years. And uh, this method continues to be used today. And for uh, the modern era of biotechnology, it began in 1953 when American biochemist James Watson and British biophysicist Francis Crick presented a double helix model of DNA. And that was followed by a Swiss microbiologist Werner Arbor's discovery in the 1960s of the special enzymes called restriction enzymes in bacteria. And uh, these enzymes cut the DNA strands of any organism at precise points. Then in 1973, American geneticist Stanley Cohen and American biochemist Herbert Boyer removed a specific gene from one bacterium and inserted it into another using restriction enzymes. And that event marked the beginning of recombinant DNA technology or genetic engineering. Then in 1977, genes from other organisms were transferred to bacteria, an achievement that led eventually to the first transfer of a human gene. So nowadays, uh, we have genetic engineering wherein transgenic animals may be generated by the introduction of foreign DNA obtained through animals of the same species, animals of different species, microbes, humans, cells, and in vitro nucleic acid synthesis. Then we also have cloning. Uh, creating a clone of your favorite animal seems like a great way to ensure your pet will be with you forever. <laughs> and uh, shelling out hundreds and thousands of pesos to get your cat cloned or to duplicate your dog might sound tempting if you've got the cash and uh, can't imagine life without your very best friend. But uh, they are saying that there's a dark side to pet cloning and customers can't even be sure they get a clone that looks the same as their original pet, much less acts like it. So as one of the picture here said, you can clone the physical, but, you can, but can you clone the awesomeness? Next. And uh, we have the um, gene editing. And uh, these are techniques that uh, use, uh, these are techniques used for altering the genetic material of plants and animals. And actually, this has been uh, discussed very uh, extensively by uh, Dr. Mendoza in her presentation. But uh, one example of this uh, gene editing is the use of gene knockout technology to inactivate or knock out a specific gene. And it is this technology that creates a possible source of replacement organs for humans. So if you've heard of xenotransplantation, uh, this is the process of transplanting cells, tissues, or organs from one species to another. And currently the pig is the major animal being considered as a viable organ donor to humans. But uh, unfortunately, pig cells and human cells are not immunologically compatible. Uh, pigs, like almost all mammals, have markers on their cells that enabled the human immune system to recognize them as foreign, and so they reject them. Because our genetic engineering is used to knock out the pig gene responsible for the protein that forms the marker to the pig cells. So uh, currently, there are no commercialized genetically engineered farm animals like pigs, sheep, cows, and chickens anywhere in the world. And uh, the only genetically engineered animal approved for human consumption is a genetically engineered salmon called the Aqua Advantage Salmon, approved only in the US and Canada and currently only for seed in Canada. I don't know in the US. The USFDA, which also oversees both the uh, environmental and food and drug aspects of genetically engineered animals, has previously approved a few applications for genetically engineered animals. Uh, prior to the genetically engineered salmon approval, these approvals have not been for food use, but for drug uh, production. Like for example, the goat engineered to produce a human pharmaceutical in its milk, um, which is also approved in the uh, European Union, and the chicken engineered to produce a human pharmaceutical in its eggs. Then in 2003, the FDA decided that a novelty genetically engineered fish, which is uh, they called glowfish, marketed as a pest, was not a food or drug, and so no reason to regulate this particular fish as the glowfish did not pose any more threat to the environment than their unmodified counterparts. So uh, what do you think? If, if you're the regulator, 
are you going to approve this uh, GM products here in the Philippines? So if you answered yes, why? And if no, why not? Ha, uh, however, there are actually several other types of genetically engineered animals, which are either under consideration or under development. And this include more genetically engineered farm animals to produce for particular drugs or pharmaceuticals, other species of fish, like for example, trout. And I've heard actually there, there's already a, a GM tilapia. Uh, I'm not sure, but uh, again, we have genetically engineered animals for research purposes, animals that have, been, that have been genetically engineered to be sources for cells, tissues or organs for xenotransplantation, uh, novel genetically engineered pets similar to glowfish, for example, micro pigs or koi carp engineered with altered size, patterns and colors. The extinction animals or those animals near extinction are being created through genetically engineering. Like for example, genetically engineered pigeons which are designed to be similar to extinct passenger pigeons. And mosquitoes that have been genetically engineered to be self-limiting. <clears throat> uh, like for example, yeah, in that offspring to the, for, for the offspring not to reach the uh, uh, adulthood in order to reduce populations of mosquitoes. And, and for mosquito, uh, pilot projects by a company called Oxitec have taken place in Brazil, Panama, and the Cayman Islands. Although the trial in the Cayman Islands has ceased because it was not successful in, in reducing the size of the mosquito populations. And uh, Oxitec has also applied to release the genetically injured mosquitoes in Florida while Target Malaria is planning releases of self-limiting mosquitoes in Burkina Faso in Africa and possibly other African countries such as Mali and Uganda. While for gene editing uh, for farm animals, uh, these are actually mainly focused into three categories like increased yield, increased cost effectiveness in raising animals, and changes in the composition or nutrition, like for example, of the milk, meat, or eggs. And uh, some examples of these are super muscly cows, sheep, goats, and pigs to produce a higher yield of meat per animal, increased wool and hair in, in sheep and goats. And then uh, gene edited animals for increased effectiveness include hornless cattle, pigs resistant to different diseases like the porcine, reproductive and respiratory syndrome virus, the African swine fever, or the transmissible gastroenteritis virus. virus. And we have cows with human genes inserted into them to increase antibacterial properties of their milk, reducing susceptibility to mastitis, and cows with increased resistance to tuberculosis. Uh, like then uh, examples of genetically engineered animals for uh, change nutrition, we have the gene edited chickens that could potentially produce eggs without a certain egg white protein that some people are allergic to, and the uh, pigs engineered to produce high levels of omega-3 fatty acids potentially providing health benefits. But uh, most, if not all of the examples of uh, gene edited animals are proof of concept studies. And the uh, proof of concept studies uh, report only that the intended genetic change has been achieved. However, uh, such studies don't mean that they will be on the market anytime soon or even at all. So, um, while there are numerous potential benefits of animal biotechnology, there are still several areas of concern that exist around the use of biotechnology in animals. And the uh, concerns surrounding the use of animal biotechnology include the unknown potential health effects to humans from food products created by transgenic or cloned animals, the potential effects on the environment, and the effects on animal welfare. For the environment, uh, escape, survival, and gene flow into wild populations were identified as major concerns. And uh, to illustrate a potential environmental harm, consider that uh, if transgenic salmon with genes engineered to accelerate growth were released into the natural environment, they could compete more successfully for food and mates than wild salmon. There's also a concern that genetically engineered organisms will escape and reproduce in the natural environment and it is also feared that existing policies, uh, that existing species could be eliminated, thus upsetting the natural balance of organisms. So to assess the risk of these environmental harms, many more questions must be answered, such as 
Uh, what is the possibility the altered animal will enter the environment? Will the animal's introduction change the ecological system? Will the animal become established in the environment? And will it interact with and affect the success of other animals in the new community? And because of the many uncertainties involved, it is challenging to make an assessment. And then for food safety, the main question posed about the safety of food, of food produced through animal biotechnology for human consumption is, is it safe to eat? But um, answering that question isn't simple. Uh, other questions must be answered, uh, such as what substances expressed as a result of genetic modification are likely to remain in food? And uh, there are three specific food concerns, allergens, bioactivity, and the toxicity of unintended expression expression products. The uh, potential for new allergens to be expressed in the process of creating foods from genetically modified animals is a real and valid concern because the process introduces new proteins. While food allergens are not a new issue, the difficulty comes in how to anticipate this adequately because they only can be detected once the person is exposed and experiences a reaction. And uh, another food safety issue is bioactivity. Will putting a functional protein like a growth hormone in an animal affect the person who consumes food from that animal? Uh, but, but so far, there's no genetically engineered related adverse human health effects that have been documented. And uh, there are also others who, who said that animals genetically engineered for non-food products like pharmaceuticals or replacement organs might be of concern if such animals entered or affected the food supply. And uh, what about consumer and social acceptance? They said that technology that was already controversial in a crop uh, is perceived as even more problematic when applied to sentient organisms such as farm livestock. And uh, societal concerns such as animal welfare suggest that many people are likely to have even more concerns about genetically engineered animals than for genetically engineered crops and they're likely to reject genetically engineered animals on ethical and welfare reasons. And uh, as for labeling, whether products generated from genetically engineered animals should be labeled is another controversy surrounding animal biotechnology. If a product of animal biotechnology has been proven scientifically safe for uh, human consumption and the environment, and not materially different from similar products produced by a conventional means, it is unfair and without scientific rationale to single out the product for labeling solely because of the process by which it was made. And uh, on the other hand, those in favor of mandatory labeling argue that labeling is a consumer right to know issue. They say consumers need full information about the product in the marketplace, including the processes used to make those products, not for food safety or scientific reasons, but so they can make choices in line with their personal ethics. And uh, looming large in the ethical debate are questions about whether genetic modifications, cloning, and other technologies stress animals unnecessarily and subject them to higher rates of disease and injury and can cause or haste death because some aspects of gene transfer and cloning have the potential to create infectious disease hazards and or impaired reproduction. And uh, they say that typical genetic engineering procedures require surgery on the recipient female so that genetically engineered embryos can be uh, implanted and can grow to full term. And uh, many of the embryos that undergo genetic engineering procedures do not survive. And of those that do survive, only a small proportion, like between one to 30%, carry the genetic alteration of interest. So this means that large numbers of animals are produced to obtain genetically engineered animals that are of scientific value. And uh, this contradicts the efforts to minimize animal use. For unanticipated welfare concerns, this include the production of cloned animals with developmental abnormalities, and other concerns like concerns over intellectual property and patenting of created animals and or the techniques used to create them. And what about implications to veterinarians? Like, well, uh, it is important for veterinarians to be informed, to inform themselves about any special care and management required by these animals. 
and the societal concerns such as animal welfare suggest that many people are likely to have even more concerns about genetically engineered animals than genetically engineered crops. And uh, this suggests that they are likely to reject genetically engineered animals on ethical and welfare grounds, regardless of their trust in the regulatory system to address food safety and environmental concerns. And uh, could the introduction of a few genetically altered or cloned superspecies bring too much genetic uh, uniformity, like for example, to herds? As genetic diversity declines, herds could be more susceptible to diseases, leading to large production losses and much heavier, heavier use of antibiotics and other animal drugs to treat them. And for trade issues, any exports or imports of the products of animal biotechnology would presumably encounter a wide spectrum of foreign regulatory regimes, like for example, in terms of testing and labeling. So true to what they say, countries have different approaches for the same problem. So these are actually all the concerns on genetic uh, biotechnology in animals. And uh, when it comes to uh, regulation of animal cloning, transgenesis and gene editing, a few numbers of countries already have a regulatory framework for GM animals. Like for example, in EU, animal cloning is prohibited and the European regulation of GM animals falls under the Directive for Environmental Release of GM Organisms. And uh, in addition, placing on the market the food uh, derived from GMO is also regulated. And it is also important to note that according to a ruling by the Court of Justice of the European Union in, in 2018, Organisms obtained by directed mutagenesis techniques, like for example, gene editing, are regarded as GMOs. And before release on the market, the EFSA panel of experts on GMOs will perform a safety assessment of the GMO and derived food and feed products in question. In contrast to the EU, uh, livestock animal cloning is not prohibited in the USA. The US Food and Drug uh, Administration issued guidance in the risk management plan for industry for the use of animal clones. And the regulation in the USA specifies that according to Article 201 of the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, the intentional alteration of animal genomes is deemed a new animal drug and therefore requires a new animal drug application to be filed with and approved by the FDA. The FDA will perform a food safety assessment to evaluate whether food products derived from the GM animal are safe for human consumption, and furthermore, an environmental safety assessment, which complies with requirements of the National Environmental Policy Act is performed by the FDA to evaluate the environmental impact of the genetically altered animal. While in Canada, any food product that is deemed to be novel or food products that contain a novel genetic trait through either transgenesis or gene editing will require a pre-market safety assessment. Health Canada will perform the safety evaluations according to the Food and Drugs Act on a case-by-case -case basis. And uh, genetically altered animals will also require further evaluation according to the Canadian Environmental Protection Act. And although animal cloning is permitted in Canada, Health Canada rules that products from animal clones as well as their progeny are deemed to be noble foods and therefore are subject to the food and drug regulations and to a pre-market safety assessment. While in Argentina, the National Food Safety and Quality Service, or SENASA, is responsible for the assessment of novel food products entering the market. Before release of the, on the Argentinian market, GMOs are required to be evaluated by the National Advisory Committee on Agricultural Biotechnology. Uh, this is a multidisciplinary advisory agency that assesses a new GMO events on a case-by-case -case basis considering their impact on the environment, as well as the risk to human and animal health. And SENASA is also responsible for the evaluation of the biosafety of food products derived from GMOs for consumption by humans and animals. While um, animal cloning for commercial purposes is permitted in Brazil, food producing GM animals are subject to the approval of city and bio on a case-by-case -case basis. And uh, part of this approval is a full risk assessment and management of GMOs. And uh, according to normative resolution number 16, new breeds developed using precision breeding innovation, which includes new breeding technologies such as gene editing approaches, 
and those that lack introduced recombinant DNA exempt from GMO assessment. Uh, while in Australia and New Zealand, there's no specific regulation in place for animal cloning. In Australia, cloned animals are subject to animal welfare legislation as well as the Australian Code of Practice for the Care and Use of Animals for Scientific Purposes. New Zealand's Animal Welfare Act of 1999 covers the holding of both farmed and experimental animals, including cloned animals. And uh, furthermore, cloned animals in New Zealand need to be documented and are required to have a uh, unique cloned animal ear tag. And the, uh, the commercialization of GM animals in Australia requires approval from the Office of the Gene Technology Re Regulator or the OGTR. Uh, detailed risk assessments is performed on the environmental impact as well as health implications. And uh, furthermore, a biosafety evaluation of the GM animal food products is carried out by the Food Standards Australia and New Zealand or the FISANS. And in the recent review of the Gene Technology Act, it was concluded that genetically altered organisms obtained using techniques that do not introduce new genetic material are exempt from the regulation. And uh, this includes site-directed nuclease techniques, for example, CRISPR gas that creates small changes, the oligo-directed mutagenesis, and some uh, RNA interference methods. And again, in New Zealand, the release into the environment of living organisms that do not already exist in New Zealand, uh, including GMO, is regulated by the hazardous Substances and New Organisms Act of 1986. And uh, approval by the Environmental Protection Authority of New Zealand is required prior to commercialization of novel GMO. And regarding GM foods, a biosafety evaluation is uh, conducted by FISANS according to the Food Standards Code of Australia and New Zealand. And lastly, in Uruguay, uh, animal biotechnology, including cloning, is not specifically regulated. However, the uh, environmental release of GMOs is uh, regulated on, under environmental protection, which also states that before release, authorization by competent authorities is required and that regulation and by safety of GMOs mainly focuses on the genetic modification and environmental introduction of GM vegetables. No, no. For commercialization of these GMOs, Authorization is required from the National Biosafety Commission or the GN Bio. And this GN Bio uh, evaluates GMO applications on a case by case basis. And together with the yeah, yeah. of Agriculture yeah. in Brazil, Paraguay, yeah. Argentina, Uruguay signed a declaration in favor of the application of gene editing at the ministerial meeting of the Southern Agricultural Council. And uh, this declaration recognizes that. Current regulatory frameworks and safety standards for the commercial decision of biotechnology products are sufficient for evaluation of gene editing uh, derived products. So uh, lastly, as a, a take home message, we can say that um, we have policies and regulatory oversight in place to address issues of food safety, health and environmental concerns. And that the Philippines has a well-established and robust regulatory framework and science and form risk assessment, and that our regulation is continuously evaluated and modified to conform to internationally accepted standards and best practices. And for GM animals, we can build upon our existing regulations and technical standards and use for capacity building the authority of regulatory agencies already involved in biosafety biotechnology activities. Well, actually, uh, yes, regulations are complicated and boring, but as they say, we can go over them, we can go under them, we can go around them, so we've got to go through them. Okay, uh, thank you po, marami pong salamat. This ends my presentation. Thank you so much po, Doc. Hi, Ma'am. Thank you, um, thank you. Thank you yes, po. Thank you, so, thank you. Thank you for the wonderful um, presentation you about the scope of um, Cartagena Protocol on Biosafety and the Advanced Informed Agreement Procedure, Public Awareness, Education and Participation, Animal Biotechnology Status and Concerns, um, the technology involved the transgenic, cloning, gene editing, and more. Thank you so much, ma'am. Yes, thank you. So, yun po... Um,
magpo-proceed na po tayo sa ating open forum. And pwede nyo na pong i-send yung mga questions or comments nyo sa ating dalawang speakers sa ating comment section sa baba. And once again po, I would like to um, call our moderator for our open forum, si Dr. Jerwin Ordan po. Uh, hi, Nichi. Uh, once again, good morning to all, uh, to all our speakers, um, um, Lorely and uh, Dr. Kao. So good morning po. Yes, good morning. Uh, yes, good morning uh, again. Okay po. So we will now have an open forum and uh, regarding the topic presented by Dr. Kao and um, Lorely. Uh, we will have one question for Dr. Kao. So first, uh, can humans be cloned? If yes, are there any benefits to human cloning? Uh, well, uh... Um, unlike, of course, yun nga, as I've mentioned, uh, unlike plants and animals, we, we need to make more, more of them so that we can have more food. Uh, in the case of humans, yun nga, what will be the application um, to perpetuate oneself? Nagkakaroon ng mga uh, ethical uh, debates dito. Why would you want to uh, perpetuate yourself? Because you have something, maybe characteristics of one person that uh, needs to be replicated. Uh, halimbawa, yun nga, uh, a great artist or musician or scientist. Uh, gusto ba natin silang maklone? Um, like yung likes noon ba ni Einstein or siguro the modern versions of uh, uh, other sci scientists? Uh, Merong mga ganong mag magiging mga discussion ito. And it also will boil down kasi sa case ng plants and animals, madali natin ma-identify kung ano yung beneficial. Yun nga yung like, yun nga, uh, uh, better uh, nutritional value and so on. So sa case ng humans, uh, palaging pinag-uusapan yan sa ethics. Ano ba ang characteristics ng humans na best yung matalino, yung mataas ang IQ, yun bang ba i-clone natin, yung mga athletes ba kasi they are stronger. But what about the yung palagi ko sinasabi sa classes? What about yung mga na mention din ni Ma'am uh, kanina, yung mga non-physical characteristics like honesty or kindness. Uh, ito baka nga for me ang mga dapat kung pwedeng i-clone yung mga tao yun yung mga characteristics na dapat nating maklone so that we will have honest officials and and so on pero ang hirap noon because these are said to be complicated traits behavioral traits are very complicated and i'm sure will be very difficult to clone so yun lang siguro muna yung masasabi ko Okay, ma'am. Maraming salamat po. Uh, para naman po po kay uh, ma'am Lori Lee, ito po yung kanyang uh, tanong. Anonymous po siya. Despite, uh, okay, from ano po pala? From Gary the Aziz, the A-R-F-O-A. Okay, the question is, uh, despite by the benefits of the GM product and regulatory safety that was issued, why does the religious sectors and activists protested this GM product. Ah, okay, yes. Uh, thank you for that question. Actually, ever since we started with this GM thing, the genet from like uh, the first uh, GM crop with BT corn, there's always been that issue by the religious uh, group. Like, uh, actually, one of the one of their issues is that scientists are playing God, and then we've been actually during the first um first uh, trials for gm for gm corn we have been like the the uh the opponent or the applicants the industry the regulatory agencies have been actually very very active in you know um um uh, in saying that our regulatory process addresses the food safety and the uh, 
environmental issues but then their issues the their issue on that uh, scientists are, are you know playing playing god is actually um they're, they're, that's their belief and so we really can't uh, do anything about it but then uh when you say but but when it comes to food safety and environmental issue and then we can actually really say that this is actually safe for humans and the environment and then the regulatory the the, the issue on on a scientist uh, playing God is actually uh, have been actually have been uh, we have actually you know uh, explained that we are actually improving like improving crops uh, for the benefits you know, for, of, of of people of the public and for consumers. But then we actually <laughs> we have done everything for for uh, to 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 make them uh, you know um, uh, change that belief. But then as I, I think as until today they still have that belief or, or they still uh, uh, cannot be um, uh, convinced that these uh, crops or this uh, yeah, these GM crops are safe for food and the environment. Okay, yeah, can thank I you, add something? Can I add yes, something po. then? Yes, uh, yung one thing na palagi kong sinasabi, yun nga, uh, especially in the case of agricultural biotechnology, um, yung mga pag-improve ng traits, yun nga, hindi lang naman ngayon ginagawa sa, yun nga, sa genetic engineering or even in genome editing. Even, uh, yun nga, uh, when man daw decided to settle down from the nomadic uh, lifestyle and started planting crops and so on, nung nag, yun nga, nagawa na nung mga breeding, hybridizations, uh, Actually, may improvements na naginagawa yung mga scientists dati pa. So I think uh, ngayon lang nagkakaroon ng mga ganitong issues because uh, maybe, and that is why uh, information dissemination is very important, kasi siguro medyo mas mahirap maintindihan yung yun nga yung use ng mga molecular techniques, yan, yung mga CRISPR techniques, parang maybe to... Uh, some people, parang it's something that is so abstract and so difficult to imagine na yun nga, yung nagkakaroon ng mga misconceptions na ah, ito ay magpuproduce ng mga yun nga, yung mga Franken foods, mga monster animals and so on. Uh, maybe because of yun nga, yung, yung lack of understanding of, of the science behind it and yan, tamang-tama and the policy regulations that are already in place na merong mga safety assessments bago naman siya maging available sa market and I've always mentioned this yung mga ibang mga experiments ng scientists, mutagenesis we have practiced this before, We've da I've done experiments on this, mga irradiation and chemical mutagenesis wala namang regulations na ginagawa. Uh -uh. So, lang ang addition ko. Okay, uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, let us first uh, uh, read yung mga questions dito. Then after that, uh, siguro pwede makaroon yung mga naka-online. Naka if you, they would like to ask a question or give comments, so we'll give time po. So, but let first uh, read more questions, chat box. Uh, okay, so both of you can answer for dito. What are the urgent capacity building needs on biotech in the Philippines? Is there a capacity building program we can look into? Uh, yes, okay. So actually, uh, even when, the, when, when we actually adopted policies on GM, madami na talagang capacity building na ginawa kasi this is a new technology so we really have to capacitate the regulators uh, the experts so noon pa lang actually there are actually hundreds and thousands of capability or capacity building training seminars conducted sabi nga nila kami the, kasi I used to be a regulator now as a BPI so we have actually uh, attended like uh, hundreds hundreds of trainings already so you know when when we have a new technology uh, that we have uh, here like in the philippines parating naka nakasunod dun yung mga trainings capacity capacity building and uh, all the agencies involved all departments involved have their own also capacity building uh, initiatives like for example kayo sa sa bai sa bpi with bpi doh the anr 
uh, actually have their own capacity uh, capacity building or capacity building program in their own departments and agencies also. So, parating hindi po nawawala yung capacity building when whenever there's a new uh, technology. Parating kasunod po yun. So, thank you. I think uh, being part of mga government institutions sina Mama Lu, so sila yung makakapagsabi nun. I come from the academe, so um, syempre hindi naman kami I mean, um, involved sa policies talaga. But um, since I've been very active on ano naman, information dissemination, um, not only for yun nga mga regulators pero uh, general public uh, also kasi um, aside from capacitating nga itong ating mga uh, government agencies i believe na yun nga kailangan uh, magkaroon tayo ng uh, science culture sa Philippines uh, in particular because many of our countrymen are, are not really uh, yun nga, parang aware of science-based uh, decisions. And yun, even in the case nga of itong agricultural biotechnology or animal biotechnology eventually, uh, marami sa ating mga kababayan yung uh, either hindi alam or nagkakaroon ng mga misconceptions. And we can see this even going out of the topic today, yung vaccines. No? It's 12 o'clock. Many Filipinos uh, worry or hesitant of being vaccinated against yung uh, COVID-19 nga. Uh, of course, may mga valid naman na mga concerns, pero yung iba, parang mga ganun din sa GMOs, parang mga misconceptions na a vaccine will immediately, immediately cause them to be sick or to die. When vaccines also have undergone uh, a lot of ganun din, research and, and, and scientific work. So, baka konektado rin doon din sa uh, yun nga, in information dissemination or capacity building of our people din. Yan lang. Okay, uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, so we have one question here from USDA, FAS, Ryan Bedford. So his question is, um, hello, may I ask the status of the TWG's work on the regulatory framework for biotech animals? Is a draft almost finished? Uh, okay, uh, thank you, Ryan. Uh, actually, as far as, I, as far as I know, the draft is almost finished, the draft framework for GM animals. Actually, if Dr. Mengala is still here, he can actually um, confirm that. Uh, the draft is almost finished. And the, the last time, <coughs> excuse me, the last time we had a meeting of the Tech TWG and GM animals, the, uh, we, we agreed that the draft will be presented during the the next meeting of the NCBP, and that would be on March 20, on March 26. So I'm hoping that uh, the BAI or yeah, Dr. Mengala's group can present the draft the, for GM animals during the meeting on March 26. Okay. Uh, so one question again, uh, in your own opinion, how will the Philippines improve biosafety in biotechnology in any aspect? Uh, actually, we actually have a very functional biosafety system. And uh, we've actually, as I've said, we are continuously improving uh, and uh, based on international standards. We actually, uh, if there's a new technology, then it's actually, we are actually, I can say one step ahead or two step ahead. So, so, that's it. So I, I cannot say that we, we still have to improve, but then we are actually uh, continuously improving and continuously uh, uh, complying with international standards. So and we have a very functional regulatory system. So that's that's what, that's it. that's what I can say. If I may say, uh, well, at least uh, I am also involved in uh, well biotech regulation as a member of yung mga assessors no we uh, and the um, DA biosafety committee and uh, you know in the philippines the philippines is one of the most stringent kung ano ba uh, regulatory uh, mechanism and the assessment is actually done talaga very rigorously um, 
even if yun nga in other countries na deregulate na yung ibang mga products no uh, at least up to now we have not yet uh, revised our system uh, nire-renew pa rin yung mga uh, permits no for either direct use or even for propagation um, when there had been already uh, uh, a long kung ano ba history we've been planting for instance bt corn for about how many years 19 20 years uh, already pero yun nga ganun ka ka kung ano ba ka strict or ka, ka stringent uh, yung uh, implementation of biosafety rules and although i think there should be a balance nga rin eh, of yun nga uh, when maybe for a new product na ngayon pa lang iaassess but for products that have been already used and planted and wala namang uh, adverse uh, effects that had been uh, obtained no from monitoring uh baka kailangan din na tingnan no yung yung ganong procedures yes actually we we now have an ongoing review of the uh, joint department circular the framework the, the framework that we have so we are actually reviewing it the, there's a technical working group that's assigned to review the JDC and maybe uh, later this um, this quarter or the next quarter, the second quarter, would be able to also finish the, the review. And then we've actually already have the revisions, the amendments that we would like to propose. And I think that would be subjected to um, uh, consultation for all stakeholders, for, for regulators. Okay. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Uh, uh, at this point, uh, we would like to ask our participants online if they have other questions or comments regarding the topics presented. So you are welcome to do so for if we have still have time. Wala na po. Okay, so I think uh, that's the uh, end of our open forum. If there's no other questions, so, uh, from now, uh, may I have uh, may ask the MC to take charge for the remainder of the program for today. Thank you and God bless po to all. Thank you po so much, Dr. Ordan. Thank you po sa ating mga speakers sa pagsagot sa ating mga katanungan. And it looks like we've covered all of your questions na po. And if meron po mga hindi pa na itanong, no worries po. Pwede pong i-message yun na lang sa amin tapos ipakonsolidate na lang namin para sa mga speakers po. Okay, so let's proceed na po sa awarding of certificates. So present the certificate of uh, appreciation to Dr. Ernelia P. Kao for her time and expertise as a research speaker during the Livestock Biotechnology Center virtual seminar workshop on GM animals for uh, Philippine biotech regulators on March 17 to 19, 2021, um, undersigned by Dr. Clara N. Mingala, Chief of Livestock Biotechnology Center, Philippine Carbon Center, and undersigned as well by Dr. Ronnie D. Domingo, OIC. Executive Director of the Philippine Carabao Center. And same um, contents po and um, present the certification of appreciation to uh, Maria Laurie Liu Agbagala. Thank you po sa ating mga speakers. Thank you. Thank you. So let's proceed na po sa ating closing remarks. We couldn't have done this successfully without our participants and speakers who spared their time attending this workshop session. Thank you everyone for, uh, for participating in today's workshop session. And for tomorrow's po, uh, tomorrow's session po, um, same time po, 8, sana po nakapag ano na tayo, nakain na tayo dito sa ating Zoom. And bibigyan naman po kayo ng time from 8 to 8.15 a.m. para makapag sign in. And same for the, um same flow lang din po ng ating program for tomorrow. Yan po, 8, 8 a.m. po. Thank you po. And if you have any other concerns po, pwede nyo kaming i-message sa aming email address. Ito po yung livestock.biotech at gmail.com or sa livestock.biotech.webinars at gmail.com.
Thank you, Paul. And now we have come to the end session. I would like to invite all of us first for the photo, uh, photo session. Please open your camera, Paul. Ready na po. So one, two, three, smile. One more, one more. One, two, three, smile. Thank you so much, po. And on behalf of Livestock by Technology Center and PCC, thanks again for joining us today and we will see you again tomorrow. Thank you, po. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Hello, thank you po, Dr. Chow and Sunam uh, Agbagala. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you, thank you. Welcome, so, Jerry, thank, thank you so much po. Thank you.